And uh, rather than going into the regular agenda, agenda we uh, begin with a public hearing on Portland Elementary School closing. And uh, Carol, we turn the yes. floor over to you. Thank you very much. So this evening I have prepared for you some slides that help us center on the board policy relative to school closings. And as we begin this process, remember that this is all relative to that which was approved by the public vote April 2019 to support the bond issue uh, that included a new Jarrett Middle School. So board policy FC regarding school closings, consolidations and reorganizations is posted publicly through our board docs portal and also on our district website. And as you will note within that board policy, there are a few reasons why school boards may permanently or temporarily close facilities. That includes efficiency, physical condition of the building, an alternative use of the facility or land, and also a change in educational focus. <coughs> the process includes convening a hearing, which is this hearing this evening. The superintendent will provide procedures for conducting the hearing and also will have staff prepare an impact analysis that includes possible alternatives, projected impact, and enrollment data. There is structure with regard to the reassignment of students and also the reassignment of staff. So that is all delineated within the board policy and will be covered within this presentation. The recommendation is that first the uh, attendance boundary be adjusted and reassign students from Portland Elementary to the renovated Sunshine Elementary and secondly that we would close Portland Elementary and use the site for the reconstruction of the Jarrett Middle School. This provides you with a reflection of the facility planning timeline that actually uh, mostly took place right in this meeting in terms of covering specific documentation and presentations. You will recall that February 2018, a facility master plan project recommendation occurred. Then uh, the board did appoint a community task force in May of 2018, and that group met a couple of times a month for uh, the period June through October. And David Hall and Bridget Dirks provided the final report of the community task force October 16, 2018, culminating in the board uh, recommending support of that uh, administration, rather, recommending support of that facility plan. And the board voted to place a $168 million bond issue on the April 2nd ballot. Our public approved that bond issue with a 61.22% approval rate April 2nd, 2019. This is a list of the projects that uh, was included within the Community Task Force recommendation, and this is actually a slide from that report to you. And you will note that it includes the new Jarrett Middle School there in the center for $41,540,000. This reminds you of some of the specificity on the Jarrett Middle School project and the service that it would provide for students through this new construction on the current Portland school site. This is information that was additionally included in the Community Task Force report relative to Sunshine Elementary, where renovation of the current building and the addition of new classrooms would occur to make room for the Portland student population that would be realigned to the Sunshine Boundary. This provides an overview of Portland Elementary and includes some specificity regarding the building, the makeup of it. It includes 11 classrooms. And this is information regarding the Sunshine facility. Currently there are 19 classrooms in that facility. This shows you a view of the proximity between the two elementary sites, Portland and Sunshine. And please note that the one mile distance is drivable distance to uh, Portland, or excuse me, to Sunshine from Portland. And Portland students would have access to transportation due to a barrier street that exists between that, and that's Campbell Street. Regarding reassignment of staff, this provides you with the context of how many FTE, or full-time equivalency staff members, are currently serving the Portland student population. You'll note that there are 11 classroom teachers, 3.93 specialty teachers, one title teacher, a principal, a counselor, 
11.4 library media, meaning that other work is performed elsewhere, and 11.35 support. And support staffs can include custodial, nutrition services, and a variety of other roles that are provided for students within the building. And employees that are eligible for placement <coughs> will be reassigned through attrition in other buildings and departments. With regard to other schools impacted, again, the shift of students from the Portland Attendance Zone will then cause an additional shift of some students from Sunshine Elementary over to Delaware Elementary, and that new construction is underway. Regarding transportation, I mentioned previously, but again, to state that affected Portland students will receive transportation services if they are impacted by the Campbell Street that is a barrier street to ensure that our students are kept safe. The note at the bottom reminds you that our current system transportation eligibility includes a boundary of 1.5 miles for K through 8 students. This highlights alternative options and projected impact and for the community task force work there really was no other option land is a premium in our community and the Portland site met the needs of what could become a new Jarrett Middle School and expand on the uh, co-curricular extracurricular activities and programming that would be available to students there in analyzing the options for renovating the existing Jarrett Middle School as opposed to building a new Jarrett Middle School the renovation costs were identified to be greater than 90% of the new costs and therefore the committee voted to support new construction. It was just over 93, almost 94% of the costs. The current existing Jarrett Middle School is landlocked, so there's not enough acreage to provide for the needs of the students there. And we know that that property is additionally surrounded by much of Missouri State University. Portland is in the appropriate location to serve the Jarrett Middle School population and again no other properties available. We also recognize, the Community Task Force recognized that during the construction of the middle school properties that there would need to be service continuing for those students and so by doing it in this manner with the Jarrett students moving to the Portland site that then causes the vacated Jarrett Middle School to serve as a temporary site while other middle school construction projects occur. And as a reminder again, this uh, project for Portland being used as the new Jarrett Middle School site was communicated as an important primary project for the 2019 bond. This slide shows you enrollment data and the impacted elementary sites. So you can see there are approximately 240 students in Portland Elementary currently. 160 in Sunshine and 185 in Delaware. With the new construction and renovation and additions that are occurring at Sunshine and Delaware, that makes room for those Portland students to be reassigned. And we also project that enrollment will remain flat for Portland and the other sites for the remaining years. So again, the recommendation is that we adjust the attendance boundary and reassign students from Portland Elementary to the renovated Sunshine Elementary and close Portland Elementary effective with the 2020-2021 school year for use of the reconstruction construction of Jarrett Middle School. Do you have any questions? Any questions for Carol? <coughs> Thank you, Carol. Okay. At this point, we will have a public hearing. That means that anyone who wishes to speak to this uh, may come forward. Uh, Typical when we have public comments uh, during the regular board meeting, we ask or we require that you uh, sign in. You do not need to sign in to make comments here, uh, but this is the time to make comments. Are there any, if there's anyone who wishes to make comments on the closing of Portland, please come forward. Are there no comments to be made? The hearing is closed. All right. That uh, and the uh, public hearing is adjourned, and we will go to our regular meeting uh, agenda. And with that, uh, we welcome Stephen to the podium. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, tonight, we are joined by Grayson Miller from Westport Elementary School. Grayson, would you come up, please? Mm -hmm. So, Grayson is a second grader. And he is always positive and respectful to his school family. And you know how I know this, Grayson? Your principal told me that. 
<laughs> According to Mrs. Jill Dennison, Grayson consistently has a smile on his face and he is committed to being a member of the class of, get this, 2030. So Grayson gives his very best effort to everyone every day and sets an outstanding example for other Westport Wildcats. We know that Grayson's family and his school community are very proud of him as well. If you're here to support Grayson, would you please stand so we can give you an applause? Look at this. Awesome. That's a Come great, on. did you see how many people are here for you? <laughs> that means you're very special. Well, Grayson, um, we're pleased that you're here and when you're ready to lead the pledge, you go right ahead and we'll follow, okay? If you're able to stand, please do so. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Grayson. Well done. Thank you so much. Nicely done. And you get to leave early. That was awesome. We'll now move forward with our honoring excellence for the evening, and we have several distinguished principals that we want to celebrate. Three of those principals, Dr. Sarah Cooper, Dr. Tracy Daniels, and Mr. Tom Masterson. Would each of you please come forward? Now, we're going to be nice to you, but maybe not quite as nice. <laughs> But they, they're oh, matching that. Yeah. 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 Put him in the middle. Come on, Tom. Yeah, yeah. 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 guys. The Springfield Region of the Missouri Association of Elementary School Principals has selected these three SPS leaders as representatives of the 2019-2020 Distinguished Principals Program. The program chooses principals who demonstrate leadership that ensures Missouri's children acquire a sound foundation for lifelong learning and achievement. The principals will be recognized during the association's annual leadership conference in March and I want to talk just a bit about each of them. Dr. Daniels is principal at Sunshine Elementary School, and I'm reading from information provided to us about these leaders. She has been selected as distinguished principal because she exhibits a professional, approachable, down-to-earth demeanor in all of her interactions with others. She is driven by a clear mission to provide a safe learning environment where all students can find success and serve the Sunshine community. She is professional, thoughtful, intentional with honoring the past while planning for the future. Mr. Masterson is principal at Jeffries Elementary School and has been selected as exemplary new principal. He is very enthusiastic about his community at Jeffries and always willing to problem solve with students, families, and staff. He builds authentic relationships with students, staff, and families and is a positive advocate for the entire Jeffries community. And finally, Dr. Cooper is the assistant principal at Westport Elementary School and has been selected as outstanding assistant principal. She's incredibly hardworking, and while keeping her focus on the mission of her school, she's creative, diligent in her work, and doesn't shy away from challenges. Congratulations to each of these individuals on being recognized as outstanding leaders by the Springfield Association of Elementary Principals. Oh, yes, we do need that, don't we? <laughs> Put him in the middle again. That's right. Awesome. I see Jay Anderson is like a doting dad back there. He's just smiling. <laughs> yeah. Next, we are pleased to recognize the Glendale High School swim team. Yeah. We want to introduce you to the 2019-2020 Missouri Class 1 Boys Swimming Champions. Would you all please come forward as well as your coach? Yeah. So in November, Glendale High School boys swim and dive team took first place 
making it the first team from Southwest Missouri to achieve such an accomplishment. We invite the team here. Um, we want to celebrate with head coach Steve Boyce and assistant coach Robert Minch. The Falcons scored 247 points, followed by the second place team scoring 222 points. Coach Boyce, would you please introduce us to your team? I'm going to introduce a few of these guys that, uh, that swam at the state meet and scored our points. And so we mentioned the 247. There's about half individual and half relay points. So how, how that works out. And so we had seven guys score points. So you guys will just wave. Jack Beatty scored 22 individual points. Uh, Lucas Chadwell had 17 individual points. Wave Lucas. Trey Flower had 29 individual points. Uh, Michael Jasinski was 31 individual points. Uh, Andrew McElwain scored 15 individual points. Colin McNew scored 20 individual points. And Evan Riley scored 12 individual points in diving. So everybody in double digits. And, uh, and we graduate one with Andrew McElwain. So we're excited about our opportunities in the future. Yeah, that's awesome. And before we let them go, we have one other celebration. Coach Boyce has been named the 2018-19 Boys Swimming and Diving Coach of the Year by the Missouri State High School Activities Association and the National Federation of State High School Associations. So congratulations. <laughs> Get a group picture there. <laughs> That's okay. You just get up, just boss them around. There used to be a boss around. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. Okay, we'll go out there. Yeah. We'll meet you We are now uh, pleased to celebrate the Power of One Hero recognition for the month of January. I'm Sarah Potter and I'm the lead secretary here at Bissett Elementary. I've been working here at Bissett for a little over four years. Um, my first year I came in April, um, so it was an interesting experience coming into the school at the end of the school year. Um, and I worked in early childhood um, since 2000. Sarah's amazing um, in all aspects of her job. She's a really awesome multitasker. She is always here. She's willing to help with anything. Um, if you need something done, she'll be able to do it or find someone to do it. Um, she helps with after school clubs. I really enjoy being able to have the opportunity to do other things outside of my job here at the school. For the last two years, I was one of our Girls on the Run coaches here for our Girls on the Run program, which was fabulous for our girls that were grades three, four, and five. I also work with our STEAM club, and it's just exciting to work with the kids outside of just the school setting for additional activities. Coming to work each day is fun. Um, I enjoy working with the kiddos and seeing their smiling faces come in in the morning. Um, we have great staff, um, and I really feel like SPS is a great district to work for um, moving forward for kiddos and education. She's a friend to all of our staff. She even goes above and beyond and um, cares about our, our personal lives. She came and cheered me on at a half marathon. <laughs> she made cute little signs and everything, so she's just <laughs> amazing. If I was to name Sarah's superpower, it would be friendly. She's always a smiling face when everybody walks in the door, um, talks to all the staff, and is just really encouraging. I think it's wonderful that Sarah was nominated. She does so much for our school and for our students, and Honestly, the, the job of a secretary is one of the hardest in the building and probably one that's not recognized near enough. Being honored for the Power One is super humbling. Um, I just feel like I come and do my job. Um, it's nice to be appreciated, but I know that I am already, so being nominated is a great honor. Congrats, Sarah. You're a rock star, and we love you. Congrats, Sarah. We love you. Sarah, would you please come forward? Mm. 
Awesome. So for our partner recognition tonight, we are honored to celebrate two organizations that have stepped forward to support us in continuing to expand opportunities for our students to participate in engaging relevant and personal learning experiences. Thanks to the Dar Family Foundation and to Missouri State University, students in Springfield Public Schools will begin to learn about agriculture in ways we never before dreamed possible. In December, the Dar Family Foundation announced that it would provide a gift of $4 million to build an agricultural sciences magnet school, which will serve 150 fourth, fifth, and sixth grade SPS students to be located at Missouri State University's Dar Agricultural Center. The Dar Family Foundation is contributing an additional $2.5 million to Missouri State University to build a small animal education facility. We would like to introduce representatives from both of these partner organizations. Joining us from the Dar Family Foundation is Executive Director Heather Zaromsky and Dar Family Foundation board members Cody and Aaron D'Anastasio and Tom and Marcia Slate. Representing Missouri State University is Brent Dunn, Vice President for University Advancement. Would you please come forward, all of you? So we uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We express our, grad our gratitude for this historic investment, which will result in the largest expansion of our magnet school programming in the history of SPS. Thanks to this partnership, some of our youngest students will now experience learning that connects them to more than 250 career opportunities associated with the field of agriculture. So thank you very much. in for a pick. <laughs> Yesterday, our community commemorated Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day with a number of activities, including an early morning march and a multicultural festival later in the day. Springfield Public Schools was pleased to share in this celebration and a number of our student groups and employees participated, including a group of student representatives from all five of our high schools. Part of the celebration was also announcing winners of the annual Springfield Public Schools NAACP Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Art Contest, as well as the new essay contest, which was a collaboration with the Equal Justice Institute. We welcome Dr. Ivania Garcia Pusateri to the podium and she will recognize the outstanding students a part of these projects. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, okay, students, as I call your names, please come forward. Leslie Alvarado. Um, Elizabeth Hardy. Evan Carson. Um, Elizabeth Owens. And then Audrey Sanat Ward. So the students are holding the paintings that they, um, that they submitted for the art contest. We can show them to the board. Awesome. Can we have their parents, if they want, to come up here sure. to take pictures? I, I feel like I didn't contact enough parents. To <laughs> we need parents. If your family members, if yes, you're here, come like forward. Forward. Um, but yes, as I was saying, these are the art um, uh, submissions that they sent to the, for the contest, and they were uh, showcased yesterday at the program at the Golois. Um, but yes, we're just um, wanting to congratulate you. This was great, and so thank you. Nice. Um, we're yes. going to go ahead and take Beautiful. a picture over here. <laughs> That's right, the official. You up. <laughs> oh, what a sweet. Yeah. 
Good job. Yes. Thank you. And I would also like to recognize the students from the essay contest that we do with the Equal Justice Initiative. So the honorable mentions are Alessandra Arazzoni, Raquel Gaines from Kickapoo High School. Our third place winner was Brandon Streitz from OTC, OTC Middle College. Our second place winner was Lane Gott from Kickapoo High School. And our first place winner was Dominic Thomas from Hillcrest High School. And also the winners were also given scholarship money. So third place um, received $1,000, second place received $1,500, and first place received $2,500. Wow. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Jill, do you want to make your announcement? <laughs> yeah. Well, I like to say to those of you who came here to be celebrated tonight, we are so excited to get to be a part of that. You don't have to stay. Congratulations. Got a second batch coming in. Just like a basketball tournament. All all the parents leave for one game. Yeah, Cabby. We have all the power. going to go ahead and uh, proceed with the meeting and the, the next item on the agenda. You have to chat Maybe outside. Not. Yeah. <laughs> They're working there. We're getting there. Come on, I guess we could do the clap thing. But, uh, <laughs> clap once if you can hear us. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next item is the the approval of the agenda and the uh, the recommended action is that the board approve the agenda as presented. Do I hear a motion to that? So moved. Thank you, Alina. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Charles. Are we ready to vote? Please vote. There we go. The ayes have it, the motion passes, and we move on to item two, which is public comments to address agenda items. We do have five speakers. Um, let me read this, and then I'll make a couple comments. The Board of Education welcomes comments from the audience about the issues being discussed. It's recommended that requests to speak be submitted prior to the beginning of the meeting. Comments will be limited to five minutes for each speaker and will be timed by the board secretary. It's inappropriate to address the board about individual students or individual staff members by name in open meeting. If you have concerns about individuals, these concerns should be addressed through the appropriate administrative supervisors, either in the schools or in the district office. If you have materials that you want to share, Please provide them to the board secretary prior to speaking, and she will distribute them to the board members. Uh, because we have uh, a number of speakers, I'm going to be fairly strict on the timing. And at the end of, uh, if your if your time to speak uh, come, runs up to five minutes, I will gavel you out. I will ask you to please hold out of respect to the other speakers. Hold your comments to the time allotted. Our first speaker is Arthur Hodge. Why is always me <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. You have a little more time. You can keep it talking. Take very long. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Oh, good evening, Hello. sir. Good evening. Welcome. You know, we always tend to want to erase the past, but I want to talk about Ms. Fulbright and Dr. Murray. I met with Dr. Murray some years ago, been with the NAACP, so I'm well aware of him. Ms. They're, they're the only correlation between these two people that they're educators. In 1830 to uh, 1831, Fulbright, Roundtree, and Campbell came to this area. They had slaves. They had slaves. So we, I went back and looked at it. They tried to erase that. And Mrs. Uh, Fulbright came out of that uh, 
deep, dark secret we try to hold so dear. And 1906, you had the hanging. So Mrs. Fulbright was here during that tumultuous time. And we tend to want to forget that. And that was terrible because I went back and read it. It was horrific. And I lived in Mississippi. It never got that bad. Uh, Mr. Murray, Dr. Murray, had a right of passage. Mrs. Fulbright never had a right of passage. She had the descendant of slaves. She was a black woman living in Springfield, Missouri. And my thing is, what kind of person would Mrs. Fulbright would have become if she had been in a level playing field with everyone else? She paid the ultimate price. She did not run like the rest of the folks during 1906. She stayed here and answered to her calling in educating black children. Regardless of the circumstances, she still stayed. And she, it, it is deserving of anyone, it would be her. And we all know that. But uh, that, that, that's why I'm here to speak. I don't want to say too much because it's really terrible because Springfield has a dark secret. And this lady stayed here under all those circumstances to make sure black children were educated. And some of those folk are still around. Uh, the grandchildren are still around. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hodge. Our next speaker is Mary Byrne. Good evening, Dr. Byrne. This is to update information provided in my testimony of November 5, 2019, pertaining to tonight's consent agenda, item 5, personnel. Please note that in November, I reported a 400% increase in the number of teacher separations from the district in the period of June to October in 2019. That is, a total of 118 teachers had separated from the district in that time period. The data in, of uh, the next section that I did was from uh, November through tonight, January. And um, I would like to take note that in the 2017-2018 school year, there were no teacher separations in this period of time. In 2018-19, there were two. But in 2019-2020, there are 71 on tonight's agenda to separate from the district all of um, which are on a consent agenda. After reading the Springfield News Leader's January 11, 2020 article and the resignation of a middle school principal, I reviewed the data for separations recorded for school administrators. In 2017, one retired. In 2018, zero separated from the district between um, November and January. But as of tonight, 17, seven have separated officially. And uh, two more vacancies are still available, one the principal of uh, Central High School and a deputy superintendent of academics. In my November testimony, I associated the 2019 increase with an onset of the new student discipline policy introduced at the beginning of the 2019-2020 year and described the similarities between the board's current student discipline policy as it appears in the student handbook and the student discipline policy of Broward County Public School District. Basically, it's delinquency diversion. The similarities between that district's policy and Springfield Public Schools policy is apparently designed to protect a perpetrator's record, thinking of their future, yet concern for the perpetrator comes at the expense of a victim's well-being and apparently at the expense of personnel satisfaction in the workplace. In October and November, the board heard the testimony of Ms. Daisy Tolliver, who described her granddaughter's experience of being assaulted with a weapon. The perpetrator received a consequence of a 10-day suspension. Yet, Missouri Statute 160.261, pertaining to written school, district, or school discipline policy, lists 25 types of crimes that require the school administrator to report these crimes to law enforcement. It also states, and I quote, the policy shall provide for a suspension of a period of not less than one year or expulsion for a student is determined to have brought a weapon to school, including but not limited to the school playground, the school parking lot, brought a weapon on a school bus, etc. 
It also states that the superintendent in a district with no, or in a district with no high school, the principal of the school with which with such a child attends may modify the suspension only on a case-by-case -case basis. When I compare your student policy for student discipline to this statute, I see gross dis disparities. Given language in the statute, the consequences for delinquent behaviors described in the handbook are not consistent with the law, but to date no recommendations have been made by or to the board to review the district's student discipline policy for its compliance with the law and a possible role in the mass exodus of professional personnel from the district. As a follow-up to my November testimony, I'd like to share a recommendation from the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Safety Commission report submitted to the Governor of Florida. This would be compatible or parallel to the book that I gave you about the murder of 17 people in Broward County by a student who didn't have a criminal, criminal record but had exhibited actionable behaviors had they not had a delinquency diversion program that was inconsistent with the state's statute. The commission is opposed to allowing independent school-based juvenile diversion programs and recommends that the legislature prohibit schools from creating or operating any juvenile pre-arrest diversion program other than a program operated according to state statute. Similarly, the Springfield Board of Education is obliged to comply with Missouri statute pertaining to written school discipline policy. Therefore, tonight, I recommend that the board should make a motion to review the written school discipline policies in the current student handbook for its effect on workplace climate and legal defensibility. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Byrne. Our next speaker is Pat Scott. Good evening. Welcome, Ms. Scott. Thank you. I didn't know what Mary was speaking to. Um, we have wonderful teachers and students out there. You know that. I know that. And you are entrusted with keeping this district afloat. But some of the things that are concerning me, as a member of the public in this community and someone that's concerned with education, I'm wondering when, if ever, these doors will open, these closed doors of the board, of the administration, of whatever's being done with this district and listen to the employees in the district. I've been in these meetings when you talked about your surveys of how satisfied employees were, and I don't believe it. I'm among these. I'm among these employees. And I, I, I think that's a problem, that we have to figure out a way. And my concerns on you gaining the qualified people that we need. Teachers and principals, look at the experience we're losing. And most are going to go out and get another job when they can stay in this district and contribute to the education of these kids. We have a problem. Is it with the administration? Is it with the board? What is it? Because some of the things that Mary suggested, I hope that we can do. Still, I wonder about the flagship school central. Those are probably two fine people that are going to be the, I assume they'll still be the principals next year. We should be able to hire a principal for that school. We have, what, two key administration, secondary education and elementary education that we still have the temporary people in from Willard and Nix are doing. Why can't this district attract those people? Look where we're at. We're in Springfield, Missouri. We're not in St. Louis. We're not in Kansas City. So I hope that you're asking what these really hard questions are. Part of that, I believe, and I would like to know if you are working with the teachers. I believe it's like the tail chasing the dog. Curriculum is part of the problem. I don't, I'm not even sure who's in charge of curriculum. But I know that there's a problem out there that's producing the lowest test scores in the state. And we can't just keep delving in. We went full speed ahead with our Chromebooks. And you probably know how I feel about that. And we're not doing anything to fix this problem. We have many teachers that say, I don't use them like that. I don't use them 100% of the time. But I don't know if we have any guidance coming from administration to how they, I mean, they have no backup anymore with any kind of text. I mean, it's all on the computer, and they're just giving up. That's what I see. And I hate it for our young people. I hate it for our community, for the teachers, a profession that I love and love to see, would love to see. I, I guess I fail to see why there's not more people speaking up. 
and I would just like to see a dialogue. I'd like these doors to open. I don't know when I will get, if ever I will get, answers to some of the questions. We're depending on you to make the necessary change. It's tough, but we have a lot of good teachers and a lot of good students, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Next speaker is Ms. Betty Ransom. Did I have that, did I get that right? Ransom? Ransom. 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 Welcome, Ms. Ransom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here on behalf of Ada Fulbright. I was privileged to be a student in her class at Lincoln High School. And for 55 years ago, um, Ada Fulbright started her teaching career at Lincoln High School. She was the first Negro teacher to retire from the city school system. She devoted her life to her parents and to the thousands of children that she taught at Lincoln. She was educated in Springfield schools. I'm going to stop right there where it says Springfield schools because there's always only been one Springfield school for black people. So she was educated in a four room school here in Springfield, Missouri. And she noted with pleasure the progress that the trend of education was taking. And she traveled extensively and was an active member of the Comchat Literary Club, Teachers at Lincoln. Ada Fulbright died August the 26th, 1959, according to the obituary in Springfield News and Leader. She died in Birch Hospital, now North, Ox North, after a lingering illness. Her age was listed as 85. 1931, the school that is Lincoln School now was built, and it's part of OTC. first color school in Springfield, Missouri for, for black people was built in 1871. It stood on the corner of Central Street, Missouri, uh, Central Street and um, Washington Avenue. It was used as a um, museum building and a history museum for Missouri Green County. There's also a, a photo of the demolition of the old Lincoln School at the corner of Central and Washington. History has not always been accurate when it was written. And um, I feel that Ada Fulbright does deserve a place in history. I believe there's one school in Springfield that was named after a black person and that's uh, Carver School. I hope I live to see the day, though I doubt it, when we do end up with a equal playing field. If we can just open our minds and be honest with people and recognize the truth when it's in front of us and not try to hide it. And I believe that Ada Fulbright deserves any honor that we could give her. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ransom. Our next speaker is Mark Dixon. Good evening, Mr. Dixon. Good evening, Mr. Rosenberry, members of the board, Hi. Dr. Good Youngman, evening. members of the executive cabinet. It's good to see you again. I'm Mark Dixon, uh, beneficiary and supporter of public education, particularly that of Springfield Public Schools, from which all three of my children have graduated, and this spring. <laughs> <laughs> first grandchild oh, wow. will graduate Springfield Public Schools. I'm here once again tonight to add my voice to uh, others in the discussion regarding the naming of the new Early Childhood Education Center. Uh, as has been said, great minds tend to think alike and so it may come as no surprise to you that some of my commentary will uh, be repetitious of what you have heard already. As you know, I appeared last month at uh, this same desk 
to share some insights and to make public my support for the naming of the new Early Childhood Education Center for Ms. Ada M. Fulbright. I do so again this evening without reservation, despite the particulars that some uh, <clears throat> saw as reason for pause. I know very well from those who I've spoken to in the community, those like uh, Mrs. Ransom who knew her, uh, that she's more than deserving of this relatively late honor. Having graduated Springfield Public Schools in 1891, Ms. Fulbright spent more than four decades of her life serving children and families right here in this community, specifically Springfield. And I must reiterate, uh, along with Mr. Hodge this evening, that uh, she did so during a time not only of racial segregation within both Springfield Public Schools and the community at large, but she did so during what was arguably the ugliest and most heinous set of circumstances ever seen in this city. You see, although most educators today have only ever worked professionally during the era where segregation was the remnant of a past that many would like to ignore, it was indeed the daily reality for educators like Ada Fulbright. Although she spent her entire life here in Springfield, she lived most of it in a world far removed and very different than that of her white counterparts. Imagine with me for just a moment a stately, God-fearing woman, a woman involved in leading the choir at her church, in addition to teaching children five days a week. Imagine this woman leaving the school building on a Friday, not too much different than any other Friday, oh, except that it was Good Friday. She no doubt busied herself with thoughts of having <laughs> the right Easter songs ready for the kids to sing Sunday morning and wondered who all she might see at service. But this weekend, spring of 1906, would be very, very different from others she had experienced in Springfield. This weekend would see the chaotic clamor of mobs and murderers. As three young men, men she very likely knew, were dragged to the city's center, hanged, their bodies burned. As the sun rose on that Easter morning through the lingering smoke and unholy smells in the air, pandemonium was the order of the day for hundreds of black families here. And now imagine the courage, the commitment, the dedication it would take to show up Monday morning to a class in which some of your students might be absent never to return, and yet follow through on the biblical admonition we find in Revelation 3, verse 2, to strengthen that which remains. Not only that day, but for the next 40 years. Ladies and gentlemen, if this woman doesn't deserve to be honored by the very institution to which she gave so much, then I honestly don't know who does. Once again, I thank you for your time and kind of attention. Thank, thank you, Mr. Dixon. Those are all the speakers. All right. Uh, next on the uh, agenda are items 3.01, 4.01, and 5.01, which make up the consent agenda. And the recommended action is that the board approve the consent agenda items 3.01 through 5.01. Your motion? So moved. Charles, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Bruce. Is there any discussion on the motion? Are we ready to vote? Please vote. have it and the motion passes and we move on to item six which is the treasurer's report and we welcome Carol back to the podium thank you we've posted for you our normal documentation reflective of the
period of time December 4 through January 10. And that includes a budget amendment and transfer report that has some minimal changes recommended. <coughs> Only 13,316 increase in revenue and a $74,244 increase in expenditures. And those include some items relative to the Ready Set Supply effort that provides supplies for students in need, and also some transfers relative to uh, capital for athletic equipment in supporting the middle school track program. There's some other items listed there. Our fund balance remains stable and steady and is changing from 18.12% to 18.09% as an estimate for the close of the year. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Any questions or comments based on this? Well, the uh, recommended action is that the board approves the treasurer's report as presented. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Thank you, Charles. Is there a second? Thank you, Jill. Any discussion on the motion? You ready to vote? Please vote. Eyes have it. The motion passes. We move on to item 7.01 uh, in the information reports section. And this is a transportation consultant report. Carol? Yes. Turn this up. This is my hope. Okay. Now, I need to phone a friend. That one. That thing? Oh, thank you. Oh, there it is. Not used to um, PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get it. Very good. So this evening is the culmination of a great deal of work, and I'll remind you that it was at the October 15, 2019 board meeting that you approved an agreement with Springfield Public Schools and Transpar, a consultant group that specializes in analyzing transportation services, and that was following a request for proposal process where we evaluated responses and identified the best firm to work with us on this work. And I'd like to invite Mr. Tim Ammon to the podium. Mr. Ammon will be presenting the information for you this evening. He has been in transportation consultant work for 22 years and at least 20 of those with the Transpar group. He has worked in over 400 school districts and that includes 40 countries and important to note that the services that they provide are for very small school districts to very large school districts and he shared with me that that's school districts that have 15 buses all the way to 1500 buses. So uh, I will say that uh, I'd like to thank Jonathan Sheldon for the work that he and his team have done through this process because a number of us work together collaboratively but especially he and his team to provide a plethora of data that was then analyzed by this team and uh, Mr. Ammon will be presenting that information for you. I'll turn it over Very to good. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Mr. Chair, members of the board, members of the administration and the public, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this evening the results of our transportation assessment. Uh, throughout the evening, we will be presenting a significant amount of quantitative information on the performance of the transportation department and on the opportunities that exist within transportation for different services that are, that are being presented right now and being provided right now. And what I will want to take you through is a, a set of criteria and a set of constraints that are necessary to enable those services and what we believe the outcome of that that service provision will be. Please. Uh, to interrupt you, I just want to let you know that this board is active in its approach and may uh, interrupt from time to time with questions, although we do want, want to respect your time. So uh, I'm just bracing you for this. <laughs> no, I, I have um, I prepared him I have for been that. so informed. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. I've been so informed, so please, please feel free um, through, throughout as we go. Um, and, and I think what is, what is crucially important, honestly, is to, is to understand that beyond just the quantitative assessment of existing service was the underlying rationale for what our study was focused on. 
right? And when we think about that underlying rationale, what we see is that there were two primary purposes that we, that we came to this with focus on. And that was, what is our opportunity to expand the provision of services to provide students access to more of the educational programs that you provide? It's clear just being here tonight in the Honoring Excellence section that the district is offering a huge number of services and, and maximizing opportunities to, to gain access to those as a worthy and laudable goal. And I think second to that, one of the things that we, were, we looked into is what are the additional opportunities to provide services to students who are currently not receiving them, um, and that is specifically in the realm of the magnet programs. And for us to be able to do that, ultimately it was necessary to do three things. First thing was we had to establish a baseline. We had to look at the existing system and to gain a sense of where it was in terms of its efficiency and where it was in terms of its cost effectiveness um, because that would actually from, an, from the outset provide us some insight into was there flexibility in the current system to be able to provide these services. Um, second to that we needed to in, in this idea of how would we provide these this expansion beyond what is currently being offered um, what does that look like in terms of service requirements in terms of the resources necessary for uh, that that are associated with drivers and buses and all of the rolling costs associated with that and then finally how do we merge those two assessments to identify what's the optimal way for us to be able to try to expand these services and offer maximum value while limiting the incremental cost of that to the greatest degree that we can and, and, and so th that became the focus of the effort and what you'll see, again, is as we transition to understanding the baseline, um, transportation is, is a service that I'm sure you're familiar with, is a wash in numbers and a wash in statistics. And so uh, the next several slides will demonstrate that, if nothing else. Um, but but what, they, what they show us in our work is when we look at the critical criteria associated with, with what transportation departments are supposed to do, which is maximize the use of the assets that they, that they have been made available to them, um, it's clear that your organization has done an outstanding job of doing that. Um, your folks deserve a significant amount of credit for a very constrained environment and their efforts to provide efficient and cost-effective services. We see that primarily through two statistics, um, one on this slide that I'll point out, which is um, when we look at the number of runs per bus, um, so as you're probably familiar, and if you're not, we will get into in a little bit here, your system currently operates on a two-tier structure, so two runs in the morning, two runs in the afternoon. Um, so optimally, what we would like to see is every bus running around four runs a day. Your folks are actually higher than that. And they're higher than that because of some of the efficiency techniques that they've brought into the system. And that is a credit to them in the way that they are looking at solving what is a very difficult problem of a large geography and a constrained amount of time because transportation is a time and distance problem and right now we are constrained from a time perspective. Right? So we see that runs per bus as a critical indicator of the overall effectiveness of the system. When we look at, um, on this slide, when we look at the use of capacity, which is essentially how are we using the seats that are available on the bus, we see those numbers uh, also are at the higher end of expectations in our business and so again demonstrating that the routing structures that have been put in place by the department are intended to maximize the use of the assets. It is those two things in combination, high use of the assets and a high use of the available seating capacity that allows us to look at the cost of the system and to recognize that you're providing services cost effectively. Right? So we've broken down throughout, throughout the system for, into its component parts, both on a, on a unit basis from a cost per student, cost per run, cost per bus perspective, but also through the different kinds of services that are provided, including regular ed and special needs and, and additional and other associated services. And what we see in all of those instances is indicators to us that the service is very cost effective. The ratio between regular ed and special needs services is lower than what we have seen in traditionally in similar sized districts and in some of the most efficient districts that we work in. Um, and I think in, in particular, when we look at the bottom statistic on the percent of the operating budget, 
Um, that is a statistic in transportation that for some reason has held consistently over time in the most efficient operations at between four and six percent of operating costs, and you're at three. So your folks are doing a lot of things to make the system cost effective, and they deserve a significant amount of credit for that, again, in how they are managing this time and distance problem that they're working with. Right? Because when we look at transportation costs, one of the things that we see, and this isn't really that hard to understand, the predominance of the costs are in the people and in the assets. Right? So everything that we do focuses on the degree to which we're maximizing their use to be efficient and effective. Right? And so when we look at the proportion of that here, what we see is greater than 75% of the costs are in those two, those two elements, the people and the assets. So when we are looking at opportunities to expand services and when we are collaborating with your folks and talking about how to expand services, the things that we are focused on to address the second part of that question, which is how do we do that at a limited to minimal cost, is focus on opportunities to continue to use the people and the assets to the greatest degree possible. Right? So, so when, because what we see when we do this is we can look at the rolling cost, right? The rolling cost of the asset, which is essentially less depreciation. You know, we have the, the cost of fuel, the cost of maintenance, uh, the cost of actually putting someone in the seat, all of those various things. Um, we are able to use you know, standard techniques to come up with what is effectively a cost per mile for the, for the way that your system functions. That cost per mile is consistent with the efficient organizations that we have seen of similar size and type and better than some who are in less constrained environments. But where this statistic is important to us is it allows us to use that value to get some understanding of were we to expand services, what is the likely impact on transportation allocation requirements and transportation expenditures, right? And so we will use that, that cost per mile statistic to make some of those estimates, okay? So again, that is the baseline of your current system. Your current system is performing efficiently and cost effectively. Um, that's terrific in every respect, except for its flexibility in offering new services, right? And so we will get to how to try to address that within the structure of an inefficient and effective environment. This is the one instance, probably, where inefficiency would be a friend, and it's not. So we'll talk about how we try to address that as we go forward. When we think about looking at your organization relative to peers, um, I think it's important to recognize, uh, again, some of the challenges that your transportation organization is facing. Uh, so we worked with, with everybody in the district to, to reach out to a number of peer districts, both regionally and across the state. And one of the things that we see consistently, uh, both on this slide and on the next one, is that the operation that you are providing is more restrictive than all of your peers. It's more restrictive in terms of eligibility requirements. It's more restrictive in terms of the number of tiers in the system, which again, if transportation is a time and distance problem, the number of tiers is a critically important component of being able to drive additional efficiency into the system, which we will talk about a little bit further as we go. And what we do see is that in, in, in Springfield, um, we do have a high school start time that tends and trends towards the later end of the scale, so that's, that's certainly um, one of the things that we're trying to acknowledge and be cognizant of, um, given research from AAP and everybody else out there about high school times. So certainly we're aware of that and, and are trying to be cognizant of it in, in designing whatever future system we can come up with. Okay? So when we look at it again, uh, just from a regional perspective, um, one of the things that we see, so, so here what I think is most striking is if we just look at enrollment, and we look at enrollment relative to tier, right? We have an enormously large district operating as if it's a small district. That creates a tremendous amount of logistical pressure. And that's part of the rationale for why there is a significant number of techniques that are being used in the system to drive that efficiency and cost effectiveness in. So, so certainly for us, one of the considerations as we were going through this is any, of it, any expansion of service is going to have to be aware of and highly attuned to what are the times within which we're getting kids to school. That's because, again, 
while this isn't physically true, logistically what we're trying to do here is create time. So we are trying to drive time into the system in some way. The mechanisms that we use to do that is, again, if we start with your current bell structure. And I apologize for the font, it's a little bit difficult to read, but there's a fair number of things on there. Um, one of the things that, that, that we think everybody should be aware of here as the representation of your current bell schedule is that it does have this nominal two-tier structure represented by the green bars and the yellow bars, right? So just the groupings of those represents the tier structure. But I think what's important about that as well is both within the tier groupings and between the tier groupings, if we look at the horizontal length of the bars, right, we have differences in instructional day, we have differences in transportation windows, we have differences in a variety of things that all, again, contribute to difficulties in terms of system design for transportation. So much of what your folks wrestle with on a daily basis and what we had to wrestle with from an analytical perspective is how do we try to make this system conform in some way that it will allow us to inject time into it to increase services. Right? So, so if we think about this as the baseline, um, what's important to recognize is, as I mentioned previously, there's not a tremendous amount of flexibility here. And where, how do we know that? It's because when we apply this basic idea of saying, were we to reduce high school eligibility distances? And were we to add transportation to the magnet programs? What does that do to the current system? Right? How does that increase the requirements associated with transportation? And what we see in that instance is your current 132 bus system becomes something between 180 and 200 bus system. Right? So we're adding something in the neighborhood of roughly 50 to roughly 70 additional resources. Now, as you folks probably know better than I, uh, one of the things that's not raining out of the trees anywhere is school bus drivers, hmm. right? So finding 50 to 70 additional ones feels like it might be a little bit of a challenge, right? And, and in addition to that, I don't think planted next to the school bus driver tree is the money tree that rains out the 3.9 to 5.4 million additional dollars that we would need to do this if we were to change nothing else in the system. Right? So. This is an important slide as a point of departure because it helps us understand how you, the efficiency of your existing system is constraining the ability to do additional things in it absent other structural changes. Well, but you didn't come here to ask us to drive buses, did you? I did not. And it's actually the same reason that I don't have a CDL. <laughs> Everywhere I'd go, they'd ask, and it's just much easier to say no. Clear that up yeah, you well, no, it's just much easier to say. Although I think there's several people in the room who would be happy if you'd get them. Um, so, so I think what we, again, what we're trying to determine here is, even in some sort of a Goldilocks scenario where we're finding a reasonable middle, right, we're still increasing the system by 58 buses. Right? So it's generally just not feasible to be able to do that. So we've got to look at how else we can change the structure of the system to try to be able to do that, right? So what is that that we're trying to increase, right? So what we're trying to do, and this is an illustrative example from one of each of the five high schools we, we conducted the same kind of analyses, where essentially we built out um, walk distances from each of the schools to try to assess how many students at each location we would be dealing with and what is the clustering of those students so that we could consider different kinds of routing techniques to be able to support them, right? So for each of the five schools, we built this out. And one of the things that you can see is obviously the dots represent students and the building shockingly represents the school, right? Like, so it's a pretty simple graph to figure out here. Um, but but the, the, while this seems simple on its individual instances, when we aggregate it, it starts to become a really significant problem. Right? Because when we aggregate it, what do we see? We see the addition of more than 3,000 total students. And if you remember the regional slide, it would make it the sixth largest, just these additional kids, would make it the sixth largest district in that region. Right? So this is a significant add to the system. 
it's a purposeful ad, and, and, and so, but it is a, ch it will be a challenge to be able to include these kids in. And one of the ways that, you know, again, we're uh, trying to figure out how do we assess recognizing, and I mean, anybody who shows up at a high school or middle school knows that everybody doesn't ride every day. So how do we assess what the right number of students to estimate is so that we can provide some sort of reasonable understanding of what the increased demand would be? Um, we went through a couple of different analyses to figure that out. One was looking at just existing ridership level at the school. One was looking at middle school ridership level on the assumption that, that some of that will carry forward. One, some was looking at a blended middle school and high school ridership, looking at just the ninth and 10th grades. All of these various things to try to find the right midpoint or the right range for us to be able to think about where uh, the increase would come from. So when we look at what is effectively you know, sort of most constraining to least constraining, what we end up seeing is that somewhere between 31 and 51 runs, not buses in this instance, runs, would be necessary to pick these students up. And that's an important distinction when we get to start talking about bell times. Okay? So what we see here is that there would be a need associated with these students you know again if they were new to the system that's where the 2.2 to, to 3.7 million dollar estimate comes from if they're brand new but if we can find a way to include them in the system as it exists right now by inserting time in some way we can have a dramatic influence on what that total cost is okay so in addition to that what we see is a similar kind of analysis at the magnet schools where um, we took students who were attending magnet schools and routed all of them as if we were designing bus routes for them in their current instance um, and estimated that we would need 23 runs to service them at current costs would be about a million seven. That's based on current students. Current students, current students. correct, students. yeah. Okay. And, and again, uh, some of this is um, confidence interval, right? Like we, we've got to have some sense of uh, th this is the only real point of departure that we have to be able to do it. Right. So, when we do those two things and we aggregate the two of them, uh, this is again where that 3.9 to 5.4 million dollars in additional cost comes from, assuming we do nothing else to the system. Okay, so that's how we got to that point. Um, once we once we arrived at that point, it was necessary to start thinking about alternatives. <laughs> Thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, uh, it was made pretty clear to us that that finding five million dollars probably isn't going to be the easiest thing in the whole world, right? So. So how do, we, how do we think about this? Again, and, and we have two levers in transportation to pull, right? We have the time lever, and then we've got the use lever. And the use lever is pretty close to the bottom already, right? Because we are using the system really well. So we've got to think about the time lever. And, and, and so as a result, we went in and looked at, at opportunities around bell time schedules and how to revise bell schedules to, again, insert time into the system. Uh, our work was taken to, to take this system that of 25,000 enrolled students and move it from its comparison of small regional districts to a larger three-tier system that would be more consistent with larger districts and how they operate. Um, the three-tier structure that we came up with, um, there's some critical things to note about it. The first critical thing being, from our perspective, a minimum of 60 minutes is necessary between the tiers. Between. between the tiers, between each of the individual school times. Um, we have identified 7.30, 8.30, and 9.30 as the times. That was primarily an analytical identification. If you chose to have it be 7.45, that would mean it would have to be 8.45 and 9.45. If you made it 7, that would make it 7, 8, and 9. As long as it's got 60 minutes in between, the routing structure works, whatever the baseline time. So it requires 60 minutes to make it work. Correct. It would require 60 minutes to make it work. Um, so what you'll see is in these, in, in, the, exa in the two examples that we'll demonstrate here, um, which we believe are the two uh, uh, best, best examples that we were able to derive, um, the first one, we start with uh, middle school students first and high school students second and elementary school students last. Um, and in addition, we are inserting the expanded service for those roughly 3,000 additional students plus magnet school students. Um, and in doing so, what we are able to do by creating this three-tier system, which again gives us the opportunity, if you can sort of boil it down, to reuse the asset again to pick up more students, what that provides us with is the ability 
to do these services with approximately 100 and well, with 119 maximum buses, which is actually fewer than we're using right now in total. And but what we have here is we also have some increment. So I, I, I mentioned this four dollar a mile um, cost earlier. We do have some incremental costs associated with providing these services because now that the buses are running again, they're aggregating more miles on them. So consequently, we had to account for the time and the rolling costs associated with that. So we do see some costs associated with those. Um, and again, what you see in our best case to worst case here is um, cost increases that are somewhere between roughly 280000 and roughly $460,000. Um, and then when we add in the magnet school provision of services to that, um, that includes another approximately $570,000. Say that again, the number? Uh, 570000 So it's out of the bottom bullet. And, um, and so if you remember, our original estimates doing nothing was 3.9 million to 5.4 million. Um, here we are looking at somewhere around 800,000 to slightly over a million to be able to provide services to what is approximately uh, almost 50% more kids, 40-ish percent more kids. Okay? So uh, that's the first sample, uh, the first model that we developed, which was again middle school first, high school second. Uh, the second model that we, that we had was high school first, elementary second, middle last. Um, and again, this, the, the progress is similar. We assumed 7.30 again for just sake of the analysis, not because that's what that time has to be, but there does have to have to be 60 minutes between. Um, in this sense, ask you a question, and please. maybe that you're going to tell me this isn't relevant or you're going to get to it later, but if you, that, that seemed somewhat simple unless you also add in the statement you made earlier that there aren't like tons of people sitting around wanting to be bus drivers, mm -hmm. and it occurs to me that you just increase the amount of time that they would spend doing that every day, and that might not be attractive to some people. Do it, am I missing something? Um, so. Uh, can we hold that for just a second? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so what we see when we look at this example, right? Remember now that you're using 132 buses as it as currently exists, right? There's 132 buses in the system right now. What we have under this scenario is again a maximum need of 129. So assuming we can fill to full complement, we've got the number of people that we require. Like eight people don't like it, we're okay. And it's probably, it's if there's four people that we can't recruit, not really that they don't like it, right? It's just the recruiting part is harder than keeping the liking part. Yeah. Um, and, and to your second question, I think arguably um, one of the things that we have seen is that when we extend service days, it actually helps retention because people make more money and it provides more consistency in schedule. Okay. Um, so that, that, that has a possible side benefit, not something that we looked at in the course of this study, but just as a result of the other work that we've done, that's what we've seen. Um, so again, what we see here is um, we see a need in the difference uh, of up to 129 assets. Right? And, and because of the way that we're structured and because it's fewer than the number of assets we're using now, the actual incremental cost of the individual runs doesn't change whether you put the high school first or the elementary school or the uh, middle school first. Um, so what we still continue to see is this roughly 800000 to slightly more than a million dollar increase in, in allocation requirements. Um, and again, that is for the purpose of providing services to roughly 3,000 additional high school students and approximately 250 magnet school students. Okay, so when we look at it in summary, um, the first, the, well, the second column that you see is essentially our base case. Were we to do nothing and still want to provide these services, um, again, that cost range is, is approximately four to approximately 5.4 million. Um, were we to make changes to the bell schedule consistent with particularly that 60 minute tier criteria, um, those additional services can be, can be included in the system for uh, in the neighborhood of 850,000 to, to $1 million. Um, and I, I would point out that administratively, um, this will be a notable effort for your staff. Uh, your staff, uh, we, we, will, we highlight in the report and we'll make a recommendation in the report um, that you, uh, you actually have a really lean transportation staff by any statistical measure whatsoever. Um, and so consequently, their ability 
to do this is going to, what, what's going to be necessary is to ensure that they have sufficient time and sufficient resources to be able to do it because uh, this is in no way a layup, right? But it is doable from a financial perspective, it's doable from an operational perspective, and it's doable from a technical perspective. So I think certainly with that we'll take whatever other questions the board may have. Questions, comments? Sure. Oh, well, I, one is I appreciate this. The second time we've been through this. Is that right? A few years ago, I don't know who else. Was on, I know Bruce and I went through it, uh, particularly with the bell change in start time. Uh, and as you can tell, we're going through the same thing. We're still doing it the same way. So that tells you a little bit about at the time. But that's not my question. Uh, the the distance and the bell time, those are mutually exclusive, not a combination of both, right? Did I understand that right? It's either or? Um, I'm not or was it reducing the three and a half miles down? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Time? Yeah, so so in order to, and well, in order to not introduce the four to five and a half or $5.4 million cost, it would be necessary to change the bell time to be able to enable those other changes. To, to do the reduced Correct. distance. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I want to make sure. I thought that's yeah. what it was, but I want to make sure that it wasn't either or. Um, the second one is you gave us a couple examples of 7.30, 8.30, and who starts when. Mm -hmm. I didn't see, and what researchers I've seen, high school students do better starting later. That was not one of the options. Is that, is that just something you just didn't show us, or no, like it was you started one of, high school at 9.30 instead of yeah. 7.30? It was one of the analyses that, that we did do, and that, um, and from a cost perspective, was, was notably more costly than the others, but we ran into some other uh, operational concerns too around OTC and, oh, and scheduling yeah, and some I, of those kind of things as well. So, so, uh, and I know Jonathan will shudder when I say this, but uh, in an effort to try to minimize the level of disruption, like we didn't want to introduce that as well. Um, but, but you know, it, it does it does present other. Uh, challenges from external partners. Oh, absolutely. Where, where, yeah, yeah, where there may be a need to run sort of what would be characterized as a know, from a subsystem. Learning, from a learning standpoint. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and the last one is just a comment more than anything. I still have a real concern with a mile and a half for elementary kids. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do with attendance, has nothing to do with anything but safety. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't want my kindergartner walking a mile and a half. Oh, I, I, I know that's not a part of this. You didn't look at that. I just, mm -hmm. but now I've got high schoolers walking the same distance as a middle, uh, kindergartner. That to me is disparity. Mm -hmm. So that's a comment and not, no criticism of the report because I know that's not your, what you're looking at. But at some point, I think that, that concerns me greatly from the safety standpoint of our young kids. And I know that's cost. I understand that. So, and so that's, mm -hmm. I appreciate this. I, I really enjoyed reading through the mm -hmm. report and, and getting it, it's, concept makes a lot of sense, but any way we go is not going to be cheap. It can be cheaper, mm -hmm. but it ain't gonna be cheap either way we go, even though it is the right thing to do. So I appreciate your the study you. and, and what you did. Mm -hmm. Other comments, questions? You've given us an awful lot to think about. Thank you for your, for your work. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like so it looks like this will take further deliberation, maybe even further study. Uh, the most provocative statement was that statement about how a bill schedule change isn't something that just matters to the district as an organization, but it, it impacts the, uh, a lot in the community, mm -hmm. just like our school calendar. Uh, and maybe you could be part of this. <laughs> but but uh, uh, this is something that we won't be deciding tonight, and we probably won't be deciding anytime soon. But we need this. This is a much needed study. Thank you, administration, for it. And uh, we appreciate uh, your work. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for the thank opportunity you. to collaborate with your folks. They, they were magnificent. I think that would be our uh, ask of you as board members is to 
you saw the slide, short slide deck. You also have a full report that's uh, a lot of, a lot of pages with a lot of, a lot of graphs and report or a lot of data diving very deep. So take your time, absorb that, send us questions, whether for further study or things that you want us to bring as we dive deeper. I think the realities is what we thought. It's possible to expand services and we're misaligned in our service structure as compared to peers, both regional and statewide and we're also misaligned in our design of delivery, right, as compared to statewide peers that are uh, more like us. So this will be an opportunity for us to study those things. Uh, we also have student attendance data that we've already pulled uh, that gives us some analysis of elementary, middle, and high, and why, why we drove to high school as a start of change, because that's where our biggest gaps exist between student populations, uh, and I think it's probably an indicator of some of the barriers that we've got in our system. So. Let us know what questions you have, and we will work to deliver those. Uh, for further clarification, months. both the presentation and the full report are posted for public consumption on board docs, if anyone's interested. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are we ready to move on? Yeah. Let's do that. Let's go to 8.01, board adopt policy adoptions and revisions. And guess what? We're going to go fast with that one because there are no policies for review. Well, the next item then is the Springfield Little Theater MOU. That's item 9.01. We welcome Ben to the podium. Thank you. Good evening. All right. Well, good evening. Yes. Uh, it's my pleasure to come before you this evening to seek approval in a partnership between Springfield Public Schools, Springfield Little Theater, and the Foundation for Springfield Public Schools for an Academy of Fine and Performing Arts Madman School. Woohoo! Okay. Yeah. Does that deliver a little bit of opinion? I, I like the enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I'm you. Excited. Yeah. Dance Your fingers, yeah, that's yeah, fine yeah. too. Yeah. Everybody jazz hands. That was cool. Uh, this is a first. Um, indeed it is. Yeah, so this presentation will look similar to you. I was here a month ago um, with an, another exciting partnership with uh, the Dar Family Foundation, Missouri State University, and, and I'll, I'll take you through a similar presentation tonight. It'll be broken into three parts, a little bit of background as to how we got here, details around the actual partnership itself, and then what our next steps will be um, if this partnership is approved this evening. So again, I'll start with um, our connection to our strategic plan. You've seen this, you may have, have it memorized um, by now. So again, it's important for us to focus um, our efforts to partner with our community organizations, um, our private businesses to provide these really um, rich um, learning experience for our students and our staff. Again, you've seen our definition of choice programs. Again, these are programs that have um, a focus theme, they have a line curriculum, and they provide students with access to opportunities that are driven by their passion, um, inquiry, and again, really central to it all are these community connections that are so critical. So this slide has changed slightly since last time. Um, we have our three um, current magnet schools, Wolf, the Academy, Academy of Exploration, and the Health Sciences Academy, and under development now is our Agricultural Sciences Magnet School, um, that we talked about the last time we met and was featured this evening in, in our recognition. I just want to say woohoo to that one too. Woohoo to that I one too. I love that one too. Yes. I didn't want you to think that I didn't love them both. <laughs> Thank you. And that, that team actually started meeting um, last week, so that, that ball is rolling for that awesome. program. Good. Again, a chart that you've seen. This um, chart we use to, to show what the um, demand is for these programs, and again, uh, demand far has exceeded our available seats, so um, that's led um, our efforts to expand and provide greater opportunity to our kids. Additionally, satisfaction levels are always high with these programs. Um, attendance tends to be high, achievement is strong, so um, great demand for these programs. We just want to continue to provide the, the expanded opportunities for kids. So um, partnering with Springfield Little Theater is not new to us. So we wanted to highlight just some things that we're currently doing um, in partnership. Kindergarten and first grade students from Wild Elementary partner with the SLT staff to integrate the fine arts into a unit of study um, there at their school. First grade students experience the Landers Theater during their Explore course, Stories on Stage. All of our fourth grade students witness one of their literary studies come to life in, a, in an experience in partnership with Springfield Little Theater. 
And all of our elementary schools are offered the opportunity for a traveling series to perform in their school. So partnering with Springfield Little Theater isn't new to us. This opportunity allows us to, to build on what we're currently doing. So um, this, I titled this coming attraction. This attraction has already begun. So um, we are now in, working with Springfield Little Theater to provide a, a more robust experience um, for students in third grade from three of our elementary schools, Jeffries, Bingham, and Twain. So this is much like um, our experience that we provide students for the watershed, um, for Camp Wakanda. Um, so this is a six week unit of study where those students visit Springfield Little Theater Education Center time and again. Um, they can go deep um, with, their, with their unit of study um, and then there'll be a culminating experience or performance at the end. This started just last week so um, we're, we're getting used to this new experience now and I want to note that it's sponsored in part by the Foundation for Springfield Public Schools who uh, supports us in so many ways. So again, a little bit of background on our timeline. We began talking about the possibility of this magnet school a year ago, just exactly. So uh, we be began talks with Springfield Little Theater, Lorianne and her team. Um, we toured the facility in, in January, and, and I'll back up just a little bit. So the, the McDaniel School, as you all are probably aware, is, has now become home. Um, for Springfield Little Theater's Education Center. So that's, that's new to Springfield Little Theater and that's created a great opportunity for us to partner. Um, and you can kind of walk through, I won't go through each one of those bullets, but that's sort of what our progression has been over the last year as we've talked about the possibility of this partner, this partnership. Um, I'll point out that in October, um, as we toured the, the facility and talked about the possibilities, um, there were some ADA compliance issues um, with that uh, McDaniel building that we, we had to kind of figure out and Springfield Little Theater stepped up and said they were willing to take care of the cost of making sure that that, that facility was compliant um, and they've just done everything they can to make this partnership work. Um, not long ago the Foundation for Springfield Public Schools also stepped up and said they wanted to be a part of this um, partnership to help fund the, the lease agreement between um, the district and Springfield Little Theater. So. It's all moved very rapidly, but all of the parties have been heavily engaged and passionate about making this happen. So well, that's a little bit of background. So some of the details of, of the partnership. So again, this is a, a magnet school. This would be very similar to um, Wolf and the Academy of Exploration in that it would be home to 50 um, fifth grade students. So we'd have two classrooms that would be dedicated space um, for the school there at the center. We'd have a workroom, and then there'd be the shared space throughout the facility. So theater and auditorium space, dance rehearsal space, fine art space, performance studio, media production studio. So we have the dedicated space, but then the, the space throughout the facility that we would partner with the Springfield Little Theater staff um, to, to use in a, shared, in a shared manner. So a little bit deeper into what those partner responsibilities would be. Again, Springfield Little Theater would provide the classroom and the performance space. That lease would be funded by the Foundation for Springfield Public Schools. Um, Springfield Little Theater would provide the maintenance, the custodial, the utilities, and the security for the facility. Um, they would also provide access to their staff experts. So that's really important to us that we can really par partner with um, those who have the expertise in the disciplines um, so that our students can get the most out of the experience. As always, we provide the instructional and support staff. We provide the furniture, fixtures, and equipment, and we provide the curriculum and the instructional materials, which is really standard in, in most of these partnerships. I'm going quickly. You can slow me down if Good. necessary. So this is real high-level fiscal impact. So 2019-2020, um, we're really talking about mainly startup costs. So there'll be some, as I mentioned, some FF&E as we prepare um, for the opening. Um, there's some R&D. We've done some, some traveling already to visit some other programs so that we can learn from others who are already doing some of this work. Um, and then there'll be some minor facility and IT upgrades that we'll want to make for our classroom spaces. Uh, when we get into the academic year next year, um, again, that's when you'll see that we'll bring on two teachers. Um, we'll have an instructional allocation, and then you'll see our ongoing cost there in the bottom right. So this. Um, particular partnership would actually open for business this fall. So our next steps from here. Hopefully we'll have board approval um, tonight and we will go to work right away. 
Um, so we have an MOU that we have developed in partnership with Springfield Little Theater. Uh, we have a core planning team that we are ready to invite to the table tomorrow. Um, we will quickly need to move into an application and lottery process. This will be done out of our typical sequence. Since we'll be opening in August, we will run that between February and March. Um, also, same time period, we'll have to hire teachers. Um, our instructional program and design will be taking place between now and June. And again, there are some classroom and IT upgrades that we'll want to make before our grand opening in August. Defense of urgency. There is, yes, we have a lot of work ahead of us. I like it. Um, and, and so before I, I wrap up, I do want to just um, recognize a few people that have made this um, even possible. So Lori Ann Dunn with the Springfield um, Little Theater, um, Wave, real big. She has been wonderful to work with, and she was not going to not let this happen. I mean, from, from day one, it was going to happen. Natalie Murdoch um, with the Foundation for Springfield Public Schools. And a big thank you to you. Always a huge supporter, and the, and the foundation stepped up in, in a really big way. And then Kelsey Bravo, who is in the back. She's always very quiet, but she has really helped to. She's had a big smile all night. Mm -hmm. She's very excited. <laughs> I've been watching it. But she's been instrumental to making this um, making this possible. So with that, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Entertain, I get it. Ah. No, I want to make a motion. So Wish it was on purpose. I've got. Uh, yes, I've got Bruce. A, um, went through those pretty quick, but it, on the numbers, it looks like to me with all of the programs we're taking, 200 out of fifth grade in round figures. 50 out of fourth, 50 out of six, 50 out of eight. Why are we saying there's four times as important to take fifth graders out for these programs than it is any other grade level? Why, I mean, is there something magic about a fifth grader that they would do this better than Sixth grade. I'm just throwing that out. Sixth grade. Uh, why would why would that be why would that grade be better? It just seems disproportionate to fifth grade to me. Yeah. I, and I, I just don't understand why we target fifth grade all the time. So I, I don't know if there's magic in it um, necessarily, you know, Bruce, but I, you know, fifth grade to date has served us well. We see our, our largest numbers um, of applicants in fifth grade. It's a transition year, so that was one of the things I think early on when Wolf came on board that that, that team studied, that that was a good opportunity to be transitioning into middle school, so that's a good jumping off point for a change. Um, also, I think they're at an age in fifth grade when they can get the most out of that experience. When you start getting lower into the grade levels, it might be a little bit more, more challenging. Um, I don't know that sixth grade is a would be a, a bad age to do it. We're going to do sixth grade, um, and we're going to try fourth grade w with our agricultural sciences school. We did learn, and we have learned with eighth grade in the Health Sciences Academy, it's a little harder to get applicants because those students have been in their middle schools, they built relationships, and that's a harder separation to make. So this seems to work well for us. Students can engage in the curriculum at a really deep level, and we've just had good experience with it so far. It also allows us to spread that, that opportunity out. So um, we're not having kids in, going through a magnet program in third grade, same student then in, in, in fourth and fifth. Um, so it, it kind of spreads out the opportunity a little bit as well. I don't know that there's magic in it. It's just worked well for us um, in the past and we've stuck to that model. Just one, I mean, this has been, since I've been on the board, this has been, I thought we needed something like this for a long time. Tell me the difference between fine arts and performing arts. Does this seem to be... I should ask Lori Ann, probably. <laughs> um, and, and, and the only reason I'm going there, I'm just going to music, band, orchestra. It's just... Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm impressed. I mean, yep. this is incredible. I just, I just want to know, because I, I think of music, I think of band and orchestra and things like that. Also, when we talk about fine art, and I was just... I think it's the vi it brings in the visual okay. arts aspect to it. And, awesome. and Jerry, I'll just mention, too, back with the SP5 and, and the study that went into Choice Program before Wolf, a, a, perform, a Fine and Performing Arts Academy was identified specifically 
as, as a goal of the system. So um, it's been a long time king, yes, but um, you're exactly right. It's been on the radar from day one when we've talked about choice. Other comments, questions? I'm ready to make a motion. Well, the motion that is being asked for, recommended action, is that the board authorize administration and negotiate a memorandum, or memorandum of understanding as presented. So moved. Thank you, Jill. Is there a second? I'll second. second. Denise. You can give it to Jerry. It's Todd, Denise, and Jerry both seconded. I, I need to be uh, in the any, book. Any further discussion? Any further discussion on the motion? Just awesome. Showtime. This is awesome. Yes. Yeah, All right. It is showtime. Are you ready to vote? Oh, that Let's was vote. The puns never end. We're very punny tonight. It's Thank so you all very much. And I believe we have an event tomorrow morning, Stephen, at 10 o'clock. Is that right? Good. Get on it. Yeah. Thank you, Little Theater. So we hope you'll join us there. So see you there. Thank you. Thanks, Thank awesome. you. The, Thank the you event will here. be at the, will be at the, at, on the McDaniel site. The former McDaniel site. All right. Be close. All Thank right. Thank you for being here, Lorianne. Yeah. Thank you. So much. Really awesome. Uh, the next item is uh, one that was discussed some in uh, the public comments, and that is some, a piece of unfinished business. This is 10.01, the new early childhood center naming committee recommendation. Uh, the, uh, uh, there, there is an, a naming document uh, that, is, that is with the board docs that kind of tells the story of how the two finalists would be uh, described in those in the buildings we've had uh, we've had the the holidays to think about this and so I'll uh, I would if we're ready I'd take a motion yeah I'd like to make that motion that um, let me read the way it's worded here that the board approves the recommendation to name the new childhood education center miss Ada Fulbright that's a motion duly made a second second from Denise so Any, point of clarification, a, would that be the Ada Fulbright Early Childhood Center? I was just reading the way the recommended action. I've got it now. The board of the Early Childhood Center at Ada Fulbright Early Childhood Education Center. Correct. So what you the motion? I'm saving that motion. And then yeah. I, I want it. Further. Do we want the word education in there? And I'm thinking of the length of the name. It's up to you, right? This is just what she's typing in. So like, if you want Early Childhood Center, Ada Fulbright Education Center, or Early Childhood Education Center, yeah. do you have a preference? Well, as we do, does the board? I, th I think what the board is more concerned about is Ada Fulbright. We'll figure out. That's right. Because this is an official motion. Fit it to the sign as long as it says Ada Fulbright. We want to clarify to make sure we get it right what you said. Unless there's an opinion strongly by the people who spoke to us, less is more. I want to focus more on her name, like you mentioned. So I would not have the Early Childhood Center. Yeah, I would be smaller so her name is prominent. But that's just, you know, what do you think? Ada Fulbright Early Childhood Center. I'm looking. I'm is looking that, at my friends and now. Okay. She's so updating it. Okay. Now what I need you guys to do is refresh your computer. Okay. Okay. I hope it doesn't go down. Hope we don't crash it. Oh, there's the refresh. <laughs> Should I give it a couple of water? I just, I just hit that and hit a circle. Yeah. I'm probably throwing this out. Four times Join the meeting. Join the meeting. Here we go. Oh, Thank you. There. Good night. Good night. Hang on and let us vote here. Let us discuss. Don't we have to discuss? Oh, sorry. No, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, we have. Do you want me to read the motion again, Tess? Can you re again? Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, have so we didn't yes. vote yet. So, Tim, the motion is that the board the recommendation, I make the motion, that the board approves the recommendation to name the new Early Childhood Education Center the Ada Fulbright Early Childhood Center. Period. Period. Okay, and then I and, second. Yeah. All right. Let me get I'm, to I'm that. I'm looking at you. Okay, I'm there. All right. Need discussion on the motion. Yay. Are we, are we ready to vote? And it is. Already Please vote. So 
so ordered. The ayes have it. Thank you for being here. All right, the next item is uh, real estate actions ratification. I think we are going to welcome Carol back up <coughs> to the podium. Thank you. As you know, we are <coughs> allowed by Missouri statute to conduct our state business in closed session due to the negotiation component of that. And it is the practice of this board, it is not required by statute, it is not required by policy, but the practice of this board has been to ratify those transactions in open session. And so we have had a number of activity items that have occurred over the last few months. And so we have provided for you a list of purchases, donations, sales that are uh, needing to be ratified in open session. So I would be happy to cover them individually with you. I'll, I'll quickly cover today that most of these are relative to the land that was necessary for the new Boyd Elementary, as you know. We had a donation of property near Central High School. We also had two sale transactions that were approved in closed session relative to property adjacent to Harrison Elementary. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer. You know this better than most. <laughs> Yeah, this shouldn't be news to any of us. Uh, so uh, the recommend, recommended action is a motion is made to ratify and approve the action taken during executive sec session for the real estate purchases, donation, and sales presented below. So moved. Thank you, Alina. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Charles. Any discussion? You ready to vote? Let's vote. Those votes are ratified by this vote. Next item is uh, the Portland Elementary closing. The, uh, uh, you heard the presentation earlier in the public hearing. There were no uh, comments from the public, uh, no statements from the public, and uh, the recommended is that the board authorizes administration to close Portland Elementary, currently a kindergarten through fifth grade school, effective for the 2020 2021 school year. So moved. Thank you, Alina. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Jill. Any discussion on the motion? <coughs> Are we ready to vote? Please vote. And uh, are we good to keep going? Yep. All right. Then. Uh, the next uh, item is our monthly uh, bond project updates and actions, and uh, Travis Shaw will uh, come to the podium. Good evening. The first item, uh, change orders and agreements. Uh, we've got actually six different projects that we have some change orders or some additional agreements to. A few of them that I want to point out uh, that are fairly substantial. First one being at Sunshine Elementary, where we have uh, some similar change orders as we did last month to Delaware where we had some uh, items from the ICC 500 storm shelter that were not originally included within the bid specs. Uh, it was a timing issue. We didn't get those things within the bids. We knew they were coming, uh, but we needed to get the bids out. And so um, at this point in time, once those details ironed out, things like the types of doors, the louvers, ventilation, additional restroom, uh, different items that, uh, and then you have the electrical, the plumbing, the things that go along with that that add those costs Another one is the interior paint specs. Uh, what we have found over the last uh, year or so is that when we do renovated paint projects in our buildings, if we don't use a specific paint, then we have a difficulty with that paint sticking and adhering and it staying. And so, um, for and example, that's one thing paint should do. That's yeah. one thing it should do. <laughs> right. In fact, I was in a building uh, this evening before the board meeting, and it had been painted about three ago, and it's peeling all over the place and so um, what we don't want to have happen is that to happen further in our projects in our new projects and so when that needs to be painted again in time we want it to be able to adhere to it and that's the problem is that the paint that we're currently using isn't adhering to what had been used that didn't get changed in the spec or it needs to be changed and so when you do a 70,000 almost 70,000 square foot building there's some cost to that. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, one of the other questions was regarding the Early Childhood Center 
um, some additional fees due to some delay in permitting. When construction companies uh, locate on site and they're ready to go and they have things that they are renting on a daily basis and there are a delay in that start time, they continue to um, have those costs. And so this was one of those situations where um, nobody's fault, but we couldn't get uh, the permits as we needed them and therefore we had some additional costs that came up. The good news with that one is, is that's the first change where the uh, early childhood center and it's been going on for a few months now and it's only $6,225. So what you'll see below are the total construction addition cost and the contingency available. What you'll notice about package four, um, because that total project did come in over the allotted budget, there is contingency specific to those projects available. So we pull from the overall contingency for that. And then you'll also see for Hillcrest and Boyd and NA on the contingency, those haven't been bid out. So therefore we haven't established that contingency amount based on the total bid cost. So uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have regarding the change in agreements. Thank you for providing that additional information. Are there any questions for, or comments uh, based on this presentation? All right, the uh, recommended action is that the board approve the change orders and agreements as presented. Hear your motion? So moved. Thank you, Charles. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Jill. We ready to vote? Please vote. Ayes have it. So ordered. So the next item. A utility easement for Sherman Avenue. This is the street that runs through the middle of the new Boyd site. We now own property on both sides of the street therefore it allows us to go through the process of vacating that so that we don't have a through street running through building on one side playground on the other uh, it does have utilities and sewer that run that it will be very costly to uh, relocate those utilities and so the simplest thing to do is for city utilities to request an easement from us because it now would be our property this is the final step in order for the planning and zoning board to approve the final vacation and so by approving this that allows them to act when they need to but it allows us to continue moving the project forward so that we can uh, get construction started here in a couple months but we don't have any future plans of encroachment of any facilities on that once the it's no in fact they that's one thing that we we were not allowed to build on top of that well it's oh on top of the street correct okay correct but they still have to be able to have access to oh, it. No, I, it. Oh, I understand. Yeah. I just yeah. understand very well. I just didn't know if, if there were future plans, and I didn't know about we couldn't build on the street at no. all. So we support their access. All right, I'm then. For it. If you are, then you might be the well, person. I mean, I'm for their access, but I'll make a motion if you know you're ready. Uh, yeah, I'm going to call for it. The recommended action is the board authorize and approve granting a utility easement and sewer easement by the school district to the city of Springfield. Over a strip of land 20 feet in width along the vacated Sherman Avenue from Division to Locust Street, Low Street, Tim Rosenberry, President of the Board of Education, will be authorized and directed to execute these documents on behalf of the school district. So moved. There a second. Second. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, that was Jill and Jerry. Uh, any further discussion? Are we ready to vote? Let's vote. Okay. All right, and then you've got one more item, I see. So there's a little bit of asbestos that is in the uh, insulation and the pipe fittings that is underneath the crawl space at Williams. The majority of the asbestos in what's in our, normally in the VAT, the vinyl asbestos tile has already been removed several years ago. So we would work accomplished over spring break when everybody's out of the building. And then that's one less thing that we have to do when it's time to start that project as soon as school is out. And so in order to get uh, Gherkin, who we have the contract with, scheduled we will need approval for them to do begin that work over spring break does, does all of that that have to occur when students aren't in the school it's best practice they can they can quarantine areas off but we don't like to do that certainly the least disruptive mm -hmm. all right is there any good project on? yeah anything else any any the recommended actions the board approve the abatement contract as presented i'll make that motion thank you denise is there a second second thank you charles are we ready to vote please vote 
Thank you, Travis. The ayes have it, and the motion passes. Uh, there are no public comments to address non-agenda items, so we can go into the two presentations uh, from administration on uh, this areas three and four. Are we ready to do that? Got a break. Got a break. Let's take a five-minute break before we do that. Yeah, just quick break. We're in recess for a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, item 13 yeah. on the agenda. Yeah. Uh, there are two presentations tonight uh, on uh, our uh, strategic plan, and Carol's up here ready to go on focus area three, goal. Yes, thank you for that. So as I begin, and as a reminder, we have four separate focus areas. Uh, we are focusing on financial sustainability and operational efficiency. And as I journey forward to share with you how we seek, align, manage, and optimize our resources, so that we can prove student success and remain financially sustainable. I'll remind you that most of what is prepared for you in Focus Area 3 has been covered at this podium. So we'll go through it very quickly. We did have six separate strategies last year, and you may remember in the mid-year report, those were reduced, so we took a look at how those might align together and combine them into these four strategies. The first one being allocating resources. And in our report, we don't have a lot of data to provide you with, but we do have a story to tell. And so often in the Focus Area 3 report, we provide a narrative happen to support our students. You have received each month in the Treasurer's report the fund balance information. And I'll highlight for you that we've been averaging 17% in the period 2013 through 2019. So again, that's ensuring that we have financial sustainability to weather any type of unforeseen event on the horizon that might be uncontrollable. We did access early childhood expansion in 2018-2019 by accessing uh, an additional $3 million in new state funding source. And we had provided you information in the budget report on how that would uh, roll into the system. And we capitalized setting some of our title funds into reserves so that we could focus all of those students uh, against that state funding revenue source. So that was a strategy that was deployed. On the safety front, we did invest nearly $3 million in safety improvements, and I have provided for you within the report and summarized here that they did they include training and staff, but some of the equipment and then a portion of the secure entrance work was also attributed to that revenue for that re expenditure, rather. The compensation study that was reported to you in June provided you information on aligning to the market, and uh, that was in included, getting closure on the 2018-2019 year. And then we also have our energy savings information to report. So this, again, is that chart that you see each month uh, within the Treasurer's report showing you the fund balance trajectory. and. We are compliant with board policy DIAA, where we maintain at least 15 costs. What would happen in the event that that would start dropping, there would be conversations to work toward getting that back to an appropriate level. This slide is something that we don't typically provide for you, except for in this report, and it's about our energy use trend. And we can continue to be favorable in that program. And that was uh, back in 2016, January of 2016. We started a five-year process with Synergistic, and we are showing a 26.9% reduction of energy use since the inception of the program. And if you look at this year as compared to the prior year that was reported to you, it was a 2.9%. So the next steps with regard to 3.1.1 include continuing that early childhood expansion and capitalizing on the state funding revenue that was new for us and also finishing those safety measures that we started. Some of that work crossed over into the fiscal year as Travis makes sure that we're doing work when it will be <coughs> attractive to students. And we're in the process currently of fully implementing the compensation study recommendations uh, in this current year. So at June 30, that was part of the next steps as well as full budget implementation. The next strategy focuses on operational efficiency and information regarding the human resources software programs that have 
been updated. We are, are continuing that work as we move forward into the current year as well. We implemented last year some memorandums <coughs> of understanding to better articulate how facilities are used and ensure that we're charging the appropriate level uh, based on the UC structure. And we've highlighted within the report for you the showcasing of best practices. So I've shared with you about internal and external site visits last year that our senior leadership team members participate in. And in this report, we're highlighting some of the best practices that leaders provide for us during the SLT time. And so whether it be how to move the attendance metric within their school building, they're standing before their peers and providing an update on that information. Capitalizing on research is about us uh, as an executive leadership team and then other leaders being engaged as well and looking out and up that entities uh, have participated in. And we have research reports. Uh, this past year we looked at improving high school student engagement and retention. We also looked at reducing the achievement gap. And in the upcoming uh, year we will continue to focus on gathering that information. We do have survey charts for your review. This is that standard question, the district effectively improves procedures to remove barriers that impact work efficiency. You can see that we did drop one percentage point, but still overall at a favorable percentage of 46 uh, for our total 1,400. So again, this is a survey that's provided to our teaching staffs. You have a sense of the, the biggest increase is in strongly disagree. Mm -hmm. Was there a particular area in which that might have given rise to it? I would not know okay. the reasoning behind that. These are strictly relative. I don't believe questions that are coming from these either, Brett. Okay, yeah. So Thanks. how to unpack that would be another opportunity for us moving forward. So as you can see, though, too, I would highlight uh, for you that um, the neutral, we did drop some in the neutral area as well, so it could not. On question five, that's another one of our performance <coughs> measures and another survey that is provided to the, the instructional staffs. The district serves as an asset to economic development in the community. Again, we're seeing a 4% um, drop from last year's data. We had just a few more people and again, a slight change in strongly uh, disagree disagree and a significant change in the the neutral responses so those would have gone one way or the other. Carol do you have any idea of the responses the mix between certificated staff and it's all certificated staff. That's only certificated. Oh I thought it was all no. staff. It's, it's our certificated staff. Okay. Never mind my question. Our next steps with regard to 3.1.2 uh, you received it tonight. Uh, assess the overall transportation services efficiency and access. Uh, we are extra duty pay structure for stipend pay and you may recall that that was a recommendation that came forward from the Evergreen Compensation Study and a team of individuals is working through that as we speak. We are working on the evaluation platform so that's another component of the human resources software to improve us to our supervisors of staff, so whether that be principals or directors, whomever would serve as a supervisor of staff to have uh, better access, better tools for supporting them in that very important work of hiring quality uh, employees to serve our students. We are in process of uh, implementing the time and attendance systems at June 30, 2019. That was the point at which you approved the budget for it, that implementation process and we have a pilot group uh, that is working through that as we speak with full implementation to come up in July. The uh, best practices fields, I mentioned that we'll continue to do that research at research and provide us with some further opportunities to learn about equity potentially as well as best practices in an urban setting. 3.1.3 compliance, so in this report it is 100% focused on our internal audit services and as you we've had internal auditing services in our district since September 2012 and then we outsource that to BKD, a local firm. They do go through a process where they analyze the risk of various components throughout the district. They engage by interviewing board members, leaders in the system, assessing our financial 
documentation. Another focus is on technology. So in 2018-19, the audits that were performed included the purchasing cards, cash handling, and federal and state funds. As you know, you received those in closed session, and then the full report, final report, was provided in open session. So part of our focus this past ascertaining what reports remain outstanding, what recommendations have we not completely tied a bow on, and ensuring that we move forward with that. So this provides you with a summary of the work that was recommended and the work that administration supported and action steps have been developed to address each of those. Next steps with regard to audit. So we do have a few that are big lifts, one not so big, but the student activity handbook should be fairly easy. It actually is in process. It should be completed by May 2020. The business continuity plan, the anticipated delivery of that is June 30, 2020, and there's more specificity included that helps us uh, understand some of the dynamics of that. Uh, I will say that we did go through a comprehensive review, and uh, that information has been processed fully by our technology team and working with other leaders within the district to ensure that we have the right disaster recovery. So for the FY20 school year, these are the reports that the internal audit firm, BKD, is conducting. And again, transportation, records retention, and purchasing. So you receive the transportation report already, and the other two are in the queue, as well as the risk assessment that's standard business. The final strategy is 3.1.4, facilities and equipment. You know very well the work that's been done in that regard, so especially the work of the comprehensive uh, facility master plan and the work of the community task force. We continue to do our routine capital projects identification process by our leaders in the system, and we have an average million dollars annually for that. A highlight in the technology arena is that 7,000 Chromebooks for students uh, were secured, as well as updating Windows 10 and providing for security cameras that also supported the new uh, secure entrance uh, programming. The general capital plating pro prioritization process and we continue to use that RS means software tool to help us ascertain the right cost. So again, a reminder slide, community task force. We are uh, restating the good work of that group that you appointed and the uh, appreciation and dollar bond issue that was approved in the last fiscal year. This report covers that. You, that's a familiar scene for you as well, the project sequencing plan for 2019, 2020, and Travis and his teams are doing a fantastic job of delivering on that work each day. This shows you highlights of 2018, those capital projects. As you can see, we were able to deliver and spend on $5.5 million worth of work the last year. The project listing off to the right there just highlights for you a few of those things that occurred. And again, fitting it within not only the, the work teams who are available to do, uh, but also uh, providing for the least disruptive process for our students is a focus. So next steps, our, our bond project team is uh, working through implementing Monday.com. It's a project management software that provides for internal communication and tracking of outstanding work. And it's called Monday.com. Yes, and it's a great tool to keep balls in the air, basically, and allows people to communicate through <coughs> that software so that um, everyone knows where a project stands or what the, I, the particular items outstanding might be. Uh, Travis has reported for instances, and so that was work that was continuing on beyond June 30 of 19. And then, as you know, finalizing the real estate purchases, the designing of buildings, we are in process for uh, the refresh of certificated student staff laptops, and then also continuing that review process in the current year for CAP. So, it's all included in the report. Happy to answer any questions. Understand if you don't have any. Questions for comments, and, or uh, questions or comments for Carol? There, I would just say there's a lot to celebrate. There is a tremendous. There is a lot to celebrate. Mm -hmm. You and your team work hard to improve procedures, and I know we've got a big agenda tonight, but I just want to acknowledge the entire team that works together. Excellent. Thank you very much. We appreciate the support you provide us uh, through the work. We couldn't do it without that support. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, next is the 
presentation is being queued up. <laughs> is, <Maybe. laughs> uh, I'll speak slower. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. The slow talkers <laughs> of America. As performance <laughs> That's funny. Is this that one? We apologize. We just can't talk without our slides. Oh, this is going to be Oh, I just threw myself. Marcel Azuna signed a one year deal no, that's not right. for just barely more okay. than the offer the Cardinals got. It's just that. It's SPS. I hope the Cardinals got something else. We didn't want to do that. Because, I mean, literally, they're. Oh, yeah. Maybe it opens a little bit of space for. We, we, we did test this prior to the meeting. Okay, so in a moment, Stephen's going to be pre presenting on focus area four, goal one. Stephen. Yes. Welcome. Thank you so much. Back. It's good to be with you. And it's exciting to have um, our second year of tracking of books. And I'm excited to show you our year in totals and how we compare to last year's baseline that we were establishing. So if you remember, this is the first year that we're actually measuring growth. Last year was our effort to establish that baseline as we move forward. So that is what this uh, year end report is about from uh, July 1 of 2018 through June 19 is what we will be measuring as a reminder. So focus area four, communication and engagement to provide open, transparent, effective communication with all of our constituents, both through information sharing as well as engagement opportunities. The strategy 4.1.1 focuses on internal information with our internal audience, establishing a strategic approach to communication with internal employee groups and partnering with our human resources team to promote a more robust internal staff recognition program. <coughs> you'll begin to hear um, a common theme as one of our greatest opportunities that we've identified is to enhance and improve internal communication. That continues opportunities for us and uh, we'll be collaborating with departments moving forward on how, as we continue that work. One of the metrics, and I'll just note, there are 23 charts in the full report that we provided to you, so there um, has been a great deal of effort to provide as much quantifiable data as we can um, to help um, both establish that baseline and measure growth where we are for the benefit of time, highlighting just a few of those, but would encourage you to look at the full report for more information. The highlight for internal communications is our uh, e-newsletter open rate. And so, as you see, the industry average will fluctuate a little bit each year. Um, this year, it covers at about 24%. We are in line with that industry average, hobbled by what we see there in the 42 to 25% um, drop there in terms of the open rate for our staff. It is too early for us to be able to say this is a trend because this is the first year and I don't know how much of this is going to have a little bit of fluctuation there, but it is something that we are um, watching very closely and I think there are uh, data we will discuss shows us the importance of the communication work group that we are bringing together with representatives from across all of our departments to find out what are ways that we can streamline our communication to our internal staff to make sure that it's effective and more widely utilized. So just as a reminder, our uh, more than 3,471 staff members, 17,610 parents. So for the purpose of this chart, you're just talking about the 3,471 staff members. Can I, ask a, can I go back to yes. real quick, just to clarify, yep. make sure I understand that. Um, so do we know how many e-newsletters e and X feature stories were actually sent in 2017, 2018. Yes, we do. Because if I were to make it, it would be that we have increased our stories, our pushing out communication, and therefore that may be impacting. The, you know, when, when you yes. send too many things out because now we're sharing even more stuff, you may not open as much, but it's not. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. And I would say we are getting feedback on the system, we're hearing about kind of an inundation from a variety of departments, information coming at them, kind of that information overload. And historically and currently, what our communications e-newsletters have done are sharing the stories that you just mentioned. Are there ways, should there be ways for us to merge our e-newsletter story 
content, a little bit of department overview. Um, uh, branded by day so that employees know quickly, oh, I need to go back to my Monday email because that will include HR updates or that will include technology updates, those types of things. Um, and so that's what we will be looking at. But I, I agree with you. Yeah. I think you've got some newness in 17 and 18. If it's a new rule, I think your trend in the future will tell you that it will... It's no longer shiny. Yeah. It, well, it's not, not only that, but it will be closer to industry average, what you're going to see as opposed to this new bell and whistle that we got. Right. And, and, and so I'm not alarmed by that. I mean, well, concerning, I, but data point or another two data points, I, that, that doesn't surprise me one little bit on a newsletter. We do that all the time and see a, a decline right. after the newness wears off. And you're defining staff as? That's all of our inter, our 30, 3,400 employees, all groups. And um, anybody who gets, who has an challenges or opportunities is because we have 50 different buildings and um, that includes schools that includes departments others um, and they all receive information in, in a variety of ways so that this is our greatest opportunity I would say but again I think it's important that we measure it so that over time Absolutely. we can track and, and be, begin to identify I would take that as a pretty significant thing which is pulling a random organization of which I am a part I'm pretty sure 25 percent of people do not open um, hypothetical e newsletters, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. So I'm, I am guessing that's pretty solid. Yeah. If it tracks that are out there, thank you for that feedback. We'll continue to monitor. Um, as we move forward, I mentioned the, the communications work group. We have identified individuals from across our departments. We've got principals, we have teachers, um, we have uh, risk management, human resources, a variety of others that will be coming together and we'll be doing a number of things. First of all, we've met with our and done the work of identifying a variety of different communications tools from apps uh, to emails uh, that all of our various groups are currently using to reach out to parents, to students, to colleagues. Um, and we will begin, we will bring that information to the work group along with um, a variety of our emails that we send out and we will be asking them for feedback on um, our internal communication. So that is the next step with our work group. We will also be working with Human Resources to continue to evolve the Power of One campaign. If you remember the first year, it was focused on the individual. This last year that we're measuring, 1819, it focused on teamwork. And so if you remember, we highlighted the Be Like Nick team at Mickey um, Early Childhood Expansion team, the Pipkin Field teacher collaboration, the athletic department, parents as teachers, the strengthening uh, family jail services team, as well as the supply center team, Delaware special services team, and the grounds team. So the team work was the focus of this last year and this year we're now as you know focusing on power of one uh, next month to begin to gather more feedback on what types of recognition are most meaningful for our team so as we think of next year where do we go from here we want to keep that um, top of mind feedback from employees 4.1.2 engage and prepare internal and external stakeholders opportunities for staff students and the community so one of the highlights we wanted to feature this year is the introduction of thought exchange. And we launched three different thought exchanges uh, during 1819, one to gather feedback on Proposition S, one to ask those who are participating in launch what they like about our launch program, and finally, those who are not Explore, what can we do to make Explore more attractive to those families who have not yet utilized summer learning? And we gathered a lot of feedback from that that our teams have uh, found very useful. So this quantifies the extended reach that Thought Exchange has allowed us. Um, and, and again, this is meant to be one more tool in our toolbox. Stephen, this yes, means, sir. how do you have fewer thoughts than participants? So sometimes individuals will log on and they will rate the thoughts of others. So they may not choose to contribute their own thought, but they want to participate in that virtual town hall. And so it's that rating that's just as important because it allows the thoughts that are most relevant to the widest variety. Oh, wow. Not being thoughtful, but that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was waiting on that. Any of those right. coming? Yeah. Do we ever do thought exchanges yeah. in, with internal audience only? We do. Yeah. We have uh, done that a number of times, and we continue to do that. Asking um, individual groups, how are you, are you recognizing your staff? What feedback are you getting? Um, also, as a reminder, we had our traditional open forums, 19 were hosted, 427 people attended those, 625 responses were gathered, and that included parents, teachers, students, senior adults. So we gathered a lot of different feedback from them. 
moving forward, we have already adjusted our engagement strategy this year. So that will be reported in the mid-year this summer. Um, and we've done a number of things. Advisory councils uh, representing parents, teachers, staff in each school feeder pattern. That has changed so that we can um, actually see collaboration across departments and gather more. That is one thing we're doing. One thing drop in with John is um, our superintendent's visit to each of our school sites and an informal opportunity for staff to engage with him in the morning before the um, before school in the library. We've also begun a new uh, video series called In Focus, which is another way for us to share information with staff um, and to seek their feedback. Doing this year, we will use Thought Exchange. We've already done that to. Um, gather feedback on equity and diversity. We also plan to uh, seek, as I mentioned, uh, feedback on employee recognition, and we are training our building principals, and we'll expand that out from there on how to utilize thought exchange at the building level. So our hope is that, to your point, um, uses will be 4.1.3, communication flow through the district. So if you remember, we talked about um, evaluating the flow of communication through the district uh, creating a flow chart or infographic that demonstrated how uh, information flowed and then working with IT and human resources uh, to evaluate the system and to make sure that those we intend to receive information are actually receiving it. This is our first step in an ongoing process for the flow chart, identifying the various levels of the organization, the type of information that is being shared. But I will say this is very uh, preliminary because what we will do, this will be presented to our communication base levels of the organization, the types of information that we're sharing, the tools that we are using to reach those different groups, their recommendations will be helpful for not only um, recommending how we can better share information, but how we can uh, communicate a flow chart so that people understand what information is. Okay, 4.1.4, an understanding of the information that's being shared out through the district. This includes our customer service focused media relations strategy, social media content, as well as district updates to parents in the community. This is where you will find um, a majority of the quantitative uh, data that we have provided you in the full report. Just a few highlights here. If you look at our number of SPS mentions, you will see that the individual number declined a little bit in print online and broadcast and social media. However, we had a significant increase of that. And so we had um, a great deal of an increase there. Over $1.4 billion in potential, or 1.4 billion individuals reached in potential uh, media reach on print online and broadcast, and then 57 million in social media. When you look at broadcast sentiment and social media sentiment, we're looking at significant boost the positive reach of our broadcast and social media work. When we look at our Blackboard Connect calls, again, this is our automated phone system. So it's the Connect 5 system that we use to reach out either at the school site or district-wide. Mm -hmm. So we saw a slight decrease in the number of phone calls that it is. So what we are taking this to mean is that we are utilizing the Connect 5 system to more strategically reach out to parents at the school site level. So while you may see the large number of phones shrink a little bit, you're seeing the, the number of unique messages increase. And that's a good thing. We are seeing our school sites communicate with telephone. The reason that's significant is we, we hear from people. They want to hear from the voice they know the most. And who is that? That's their principal. And so the more we can encourage our building leaders to engage at the building level um, and alert parents when it's necessary, um, the better. Social media engage Facebook, both engagement and the number of posts. We've also seen an increase in the number of fans or followers across the three social media platforms that we track. You'll see significant engagement there. Total video views, um, and I would say this is driven in large part by our strategy around the property. Um, significant increase in video views across all platforms except for Twitter, and I would say again, Twitter industry-wide is seeing a bit of a, a dip in engagement, so I would say that that is not a surprise. We've also seen uh, an increase in our web traffic to SPS.org and the number of feature stories and faces of SPS. Next steps. So we, as a reminder, looked at increasing 
across applicable uh, metrics as much as possible. So where did we meet that goal? We exceeded 5% growth in the potential media outreach, so 54% to 3% in social. We um, exceeded 5% growth in our positive sentiment on broadcast and, and social media. We exceeded it in social engagement on Facebook and Instagram and in the number of posts on Facebook. We exceeded the 5% growth in fans and followers. We exceeded the 5% growth in video clicks on our ISPS app. And finally, in the number of unique calls made through Blackboard. So we have seen um, that 5% growth um, in the excess of that in a number of the metrics. And I thought I would just mention there, um, it's also important to note this is the first year that we measured text, 59,000 texts sent across our district. And that, that uh, covered everything from attendance, events, grades, and uh, school cancellation. So it'll be interesting to see that as we continue to move forward. 4.1.5 is about branding, evaluating, updating, and improving the district brand. And as you know, our brand is focused on Proposition as safer, stronger schools. And we did that in a number of ways. Um, we uh, did our best to quantify the reach of the Prop S information outreach efforts. Um, you'll see everything here from our 417 Magazine feature in the Learning Together series. Um, we also, everything from brochure direct mail, cards, the social media reach, traditional media reach, that's impressions in all of our uh, media outlets, emails, flyers, um, everything from open house facility tours, presentations to communities, um, number of contacts made at those presentations. Um, if you'll see, we did a, a video series, six products, projects as well as a few overview videos and the video views topped 153,000 um, and so I think as we quantify the, the reach of that 2.7 million impressions but I think another important thing is we've done our best to um, establish a value for what it would cost the district to pay for the Also, of note, the Learning Together publication was a 16-page publication that the Foundation for Springfield Public Schools made possible with J.W. Terrell, Mercy, um, and uh, that allowed us to focus on a mid seven magazine. Our team has also worked very closely with the Explore team on branding um, related to the Explore guides, brochures, and advertising, and so I um, want to acknowledge that collaborative work as well. Next steps, we are finalizing an RFP that will go out. Um, in the next week or two to seek uh, interest in a branding study. That's the goal is to establish a new district brand and logo, which we're so excited about. And that work will be concluded this spring in time for the new facilities that are being built as part of Proposition S. We're very excited about that. And next steps with branding are progress as promised. We're on the work that we've done through social media, video, e-newsletters, feature stories, earned media, and groundbreaking ribbon cutting ceremonies to remind our constituents that work is moving forward, projects are on time, and they're on budget, and they're in the best interests of our students. Finally, 4.1.6 is fees a strategy that was brought over from another focus area and we are excited about the work that we are doing with our AAA department. There is um, significant work to be done and I think this is another area where there is an opportunity for great improvement. If we look at our surveys, we see that we declined in 2018 surveys as well as the spring student, family, and teacher and staff surveys. That is in terms of participation. What is a bright spot here is that we more than doubled the spring family uh, engagement and we know why that was the, the opportunity where we played a part to make sure that we were sharing the opportunity across a variety of different platforms we were emailing we were doing a uh, principal e-newsletters social media we were calling to remind and so what it shows us is when we are intentional and we are collaborative and we are sharing the information in a variety of ways to that work um, in the other areas, and that is what we're committed to doing. And again, uh, if you look, you know, there is the 2016-17 was um, the initial baseline year before it was moved over into focus area four, so it will be interesting to see where this trends as we move forward. We will replicate that, streamline the survey process, maintain our survey calendar, 
um, and continue to communicate that so staff not only know what opportunities there are for feedback, but when they can expect those surveys to arrive in their inbox. And again, remind them across multiple platforms about the opportunity. And I, I think this is it is really terrific. I think the next one of the next steps here will be is the reference very early on is to effective communication. Yes. And the open question is effective at what? And so what are the outcomes? Not just frequency and how many people open it, but is it moving the needle in terms of whatever the case may be? So I think effective is going to be the real challenge as as we go forward. And we're not going to find causality here, but but there may be correlation, right? We ought to be moving some of those outcome measures um, in, in positive directions, right. so, which is almost impossible to do. So, <laughs> I'm other comments for Stephen? Questions? I'll say the same thing. Lots to celebrate. Um, I love that you're bringing, you know, measurable metrics and, and um, goals to communication um, I think you've already said but the I mean some of the biggest work that you did during this time period was the communication internally and externally for the bond initiative for proposition s and so without you and your teams uh, full everything else aside, that focus was incredible incredible quality incredible communication in even moving forward with accountability on that, which is what we said we would do, the the um, you know all the updates that are out there on the website and all the things that get pushed out, and um, I concur with you in terms of I love that we're starting to look at a flow. Mm -hmm. We need to keep moving forward with that. I love that we're that you're talking about focusing more on that internal communication and really improving that. Um, there's, you know, there's so many this large systems. So I thank you for being thoughtful and looking to maximize and improve all of those things. Thank you. Jill? So just briefly, uh, I have a much more basic comment because you had so much content there and you're working on so many things. I'm really, I'm glad you ended on this slide because I'm really looking forward to replacing the <laughs> story. <laughs> I, I clip art. stand ready to see what you got. I think that there are many that would agree with you on that. So. And, and I know I'm not. I don't mean to sound negative, right. but that really caught my attention, and I'm interested. Awesome. Excited. We look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your feedback. You. Appreciate it. Our reports from administration. And 1401 is administrative reports. John, quickly roll through, Carol. I believe I have shared enough for this evening. <laughs> we'll take it. Thank you. I, I want to say two things. So, <laughs> but, but, no, but, but, that's not how you leave. Not so much. Uh, <laughs> others, even worse than that. <clears throat> I said it to you before at the podium. I want to say it again. It's a love-hate relationship that we have with these reports. We do see the value in them internally, and we hope you appreciate that as well. Uh, it's a lot of work, extra work focused on the ball, or the balls, whatever those are. <laughs> so <clears throat> we've been really, really busy. And uh, just today, uh, just sharing a little operational moment. You know whenever there's snow, we have great teams that take care of business around here. Today, there was a little power outage that occurred. Mm -hmm. And uh, our city utilities partners, in the meantime, our nutrition staff, nutrition services staff, <clears throat> and others, they were taking care of business as well. So. We just have wonderful people doing the right things for kids and helping them stay focused on learning. So I just want to say that. That was yes. worth saying. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Yeah. Well done. Yeah. We were going to be picky, yeah. but that went well. Um, and learning tour. Um, I going to be facilitating some student forums at all our high schools to kind of gauge what our students are experiencing, you know, in the learning environment, whether it's in the classroom or outside. And I'm also going to be facilitating those forums with Tony Robinson from the NAACP. And then I, along with L.A. and Brian Vega, will lead five two-hour universities which are a part of our leadership development series. Can I make a comment yep. before we yep. move on? I would just, I don't think we've all been together since I learned of this. Yes. We now have a doctor. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes, right. right. <laughs> yeah, she completed in the, right before the new year, right? Congratulations. So congrats. Congratulations. Congratulations. It's a big deal. Yeah, we'll find that out.
lot of work. Good for you. Thank you. A couple things, um, as you all know, ensuring effective teachers, leaders, and support personnel is the focus of our work in human resources. And uh, one, our early hiring efforts are underway. Our first set of structured interviews is next week, January 28th. We have postings up to support that early hiring when our pool is at its peak. Um, the early notice incentive is also one of the efforts that we have underway to support notifications during that hiring process. And in that regard, um, I want to just remind you that as we looked back at our Focus Area 2 report um, a few months ago, we did look at retention and attrition rates. And our retention, when it comes to certificated teachers, it is currently at 91.7% attrition. So our retention is quite high. And uh, the lowest that that retention rate has been in the last several years was in 2016 when it was at 90.3%. And so we've seen consistently retention in that 90 plus percent range. And as we look at where we are now, going into next year, it is not inconsistent with those numbers that we have seen. Early notice incentive, we did have um, this evening 63 early notifications for the month of January that we reported that you approved as compared to 52 last January as well. We'll see that we ranged from 81 in January of 16 to 71 in January of 18. And so that 63 is not out of the norm from what we have seen um, in the last several years. So I wanted to provide you that context and that clarification as well. A few moments ago, we pushed out a news release regarding uh, your decision to Sorry. further expand choice. So. Um, mm -hmm. I'm already getting text messages about it that people yeah. are excited. So I, we expect there'll be um, yeah. broad interest from the media and the community um, and our families and students. So thank you for that um, important decision. We're also about different strands for our students and those will continue um, through the end of the month. So we look forward to seeing um, interest and in participation in Go Caps. Teacher of the Year applications are currently open and those will be due on January 31st. So we look forward to celebrating um, this year's Teacher of the Year and all our working efforts to continue to share information about free and reduced meal applications. Those uh, for families in need, um, they continue uh, applications are being accepted for those, so. I think that's it for uh, admin reports. I'll shift to legislative updates and uh, you know, we're back. We are, uh, on in session time, so I'll start legislatively, then I'll talk budget and kind of the uh, state of the state from the governor. So uh, the things that are out there that we're watching are voucher bills, charter bills, uh, that we've had fuel, biodiesel bills that we've already provided information on that impact our transportation system. Uh, today I had, that's why I have which is a transportation overflow bill that allows money from the formula to, to, to move to the transportation budget. We've had money that has been left over the last right. two years that they could not allocate that went back to general revenues. And we all know that we're shortchanging transportation significantly. So I worked with Senator Cunningham on the districts that allow the flow to happen automatically. Uh, so we hope we'll see if we'll get it moving. Right. I know Jerry was also there to listen to testimony on some uh, voucher slash tax credit bills. Uh, and they're similar uh, as we've seen in the past, as, as are the charter bills. Some of the other things that I think are going to be a more prominent role in charter funding structure, as there's been an uh, issue with KC Public and the charter funding structure, that's going to be a hot button yes. item, as well as property tax related bills, uh, as uh, there's been a, a multitude of those filed that would either have caps or structures that would change assessors' roles and responsibilities. So we're tomorrow to testify on a bill regarding this issue. So I appreciate Carol's team uh, giving us all the feedback and we're in constant communication with our assessor's office. They're working in partnership with us to get information to analyze the impact of each one of these bills uh, because it's large when we're a locally funded system. For the stuff on that side, uh, also last week was the state of the state uh, from Governor Parson and he had some things to say about education and his budget immediately follows that. So full funding of the formula is recommended. The only unfortunate thing is we know that that doesn't include much new money this year, that the SAT did not go up. Uh, so that's a very limited interest. Dollars, and we know we're 170 uh, 
uh, I think $180 million short of that. We were hoping for a little bit larger. This budget will go to the House for them to start the process and then follow to the Senate. And we'll be advocating to get that number up. Uh, he also br did bring up teacher pay and uh, the opportunity. But that's not a check, right, in order for that to happen. That's an expectation of collaboration and conversation about how we do that better. Uh, the good thing that we say is we're leading the region. We've made a commitment to that, uh, but we believe in that elevated number also. We just have to think about how to strategically get there as a state in order to make that a, a real impact on that number. So we'll continue that conversation and look forward to that. There's some preschool grant dollars that came in uh, that are going to help uh, kind of strategically build out the preschool program statewide, work keys readiness investment uh, in the governor's budget. Uh, those are the bits that speaks to the work that you've been a part of and that this district's been a part of is that the governor did put uh, two line items in his education budget that would actually fund, provide funds for our launch program to expand programming that aligns to some of his work that we've had success with, for example, JAG. Uh, so they don't have access to that programming. Uh, there's a small line item that would allow us to provide a virtual platform, uh, a virtual course for that as well as look at Missouri workforce needs and where those gaps are. And we know he's highly passionate about workforce needs. Uh, so there's some uh, potential seed money to help us develop coursework that can be accessed for the delivery of those resources, but they did make it into the initial budget. Uh, so we'll be tracking that and providing feedback. And that just, I think, speaks to the, the impact that launch has had on not just our district, but the state as a whole, over 250 districts serving 20,000 kids this semester, or 20,000 course off. Uh, and it's uh, an asset that the state sees that they should invest in also. So uh, those are some good news that we'll be tracking and uh, provide your input as you're engaging, right? So I know many of you will be a part of Legislative Salute tomorrow night. Uh, that's hosted by the Chamber and the Metro Partnership to engage with legislators. And I know you'll be up as part of probably MSBA's visit. As We've got a long ways to go. We're just getting started. I think that's it, unless you have questions on legislative. John, thank you. Any questions for John on legislative issues? Jerry, do you have anything to add on that? Um, not specifically on any of the bills, but it's just kind of goes into the upcoming meetings. I'll Tomorrow, if you're interested, MSBA is having a legislative webinar at noon. Mm -hmm. If you're interested, you can go. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. But if you want to go to the website, you can sign up for that legislative, giving up the idea of what, what's out there, where MSBA is going. And the report. And then, I don't know if you mentioned legislative forum on February 10th. Yeah, I couldn't remember the date. I know February 10th up, so. is the legis MSBA legislative forum. It'll be an opportunity for board members to go up to the Capitol and spend the morning and then go visit oh. uh, legislators at the Capitol as far as officially. What, Jerry, February? February 10th, 10th. Monday. I think we well, send out a reminder, and then if you and, have uh, interest in getting, her, getting registered, she'll be glad to take care of it. One good thing about that is we have a student showcase in the rotunda. Mm -hmm where schools around the state um, and just let to go out and just have an opportunity to visit with students and see what good things are happening in public ed. So February 10th. Uh, do we have any on the list this year? We've we had them historically, but I don't know that we have. I don't know if we have any uh, in the showcase. Not in, the in, the not in this, this student showcase. Yeah. I think we have a few others. But yeah. Okay. We've done go caps. We've done. Uh, yeah, what? Remember what our choice structure a little bit. There'll so. be another one. Yep. But uh, those are good ones. Opportunity to go visit uh, legislators. We're in. We're in 15.01 on the agenda. Any visits or anything you will wish to report on? I know. Um, I know Denise and I attended the multicultural event yesterday, and that was. It was spirited and lo lots of loud singing and great dancers and students and parents and people from all over were there so I thought it was a really let me share with you some upcoming meetings uh, of course 10 o'clock tomorrow is the announcement of that uh, of the fine arts and performing arts program that's over at uh, at the uh, arts uh, at the Landers theater educational facility and then tomorrow night is 
the uh, salute. I'll be interesting to hear, I won't be going, but I'll be interested to hear back from you all for how the new format works. Uh, our next study session is February 4th, uh, and then our next regular meeting will be uh, two weeks after February 27th is the uh, Springfield Council of PTA Founders Day Banquet. That will be a Kickapoo this year. That's uh, February 27th at 6 p.m. You heard about the the uh, MSBA legislative webinar at noon tomorrow, and then the February. Uh, item 1601 is the plus delta purpose statement. Please uh, offer those to Kathy. We used some from previous meetings tonight. I can share with you what that is later if you like. And then uh, item 17 is the one. Action is that we do in fact go into an executive session uh, after this meeting to discuss legal, real estate, and personnel matters as provided in section 610.021, subparagraphs 1, 2, 3, and 13 of the revised statutes of Missouri. Is there a motion? Thank you for the second part. Uh, we ready to vote? Please vote. And while we do that, we thank uh, people in the audience for sticking around. We'll see you next time. I think we're doing great.